Welcome to the full story series right here at Comic Storian. On this channel, we like to take the lore behind your favorite video games, comic books, and movies, and we break them down into digestible bites, giving you an audio drama, allowing you to keep up with your favorite pop culture element while going on with your day-to-day -day life. Occasionally, our playlists get very long and confusing, containing many, many videos that may or may not be linked together. And so to correct this, we come out with these full story videos. It's what we consider to be the entire story you need to know to understand what's happening. Now today we're going to be giving you the Secret Empire storyline, but this one isn't going to be kind of clean cut like many of our other storylines. In order to fully understand what is going on in Secret Empire, there are some core things that happened before the Secret Empire and the Civil War II that you kind of need to know as to what is going on so that you can kind of have a better understanding. A few of the ones that are going to stand out is the Rage of Ultron, which is going to explain how Ultron and Hank Pym merged together. We're going to talk about how Ultron came back. We're going to talk about Avengers standoff, how Steve Rogers became normal again. And then we're going to talk about his eventual Hail Hydra moment. All of this is going to come together, and then we're going to touch on the Civil War comic and the stuff that's related to Civil War overall and what happened with Steve. Like I said, it's going to be a little confusing, but as we give you all of the prelude, we will hit Secret Empire, and then you'll get the entire story. You'll have a better understanding as to what is actually happening in the Secret Empire. Now, I hope you guys enjoy, and we will tell you what videos we chose to put into this playlist as they begin on the video. But there are going to be some things missing that you probably assume is very important to it. It's something we may not have actually covered on the channel. So this is what we covered on the channel and what we consider important. I hope you guys enjoy. Our story begins years ago. The savage monkeys are rage-filled and claustrophobic, climbing over one another to nowhere. Confused by logic, they dismiss it. Vicious, filthy, selfish, fearful, a fungal infection for which there is only one cure, the Rage of Ultron. Captain America is running through a destroyed Manhattan as he shouts out for everyone to stick together and not to panic. But as Ultron lifts off into the sky, destroying a number of cars next to him, Captain America finds himself leaping to save a civilian caught in the crossfire. He turns to Ultron. Your fight is with me, Ultron! What a fleeting moat of disillusion. Ultron says as he opens fire on Captain America, who's hiding behind his shield. You have false hope. A promise you lack the power to keep. Good thing he isn't alone, Beast yells as he leaps into the fight with Hawkeye behind him on his Avengers hoverbike. Beast provides the distraction, while Hawkeye uses a 30 megaton depth arrow on Ultron's neck, separating his head from his body. Beast, Hawkeye, and Cap begin running through the streets, telling everyone to get to the George Washington Bridge. They need to end this. But before they can get very far, Ultron breaks through a wall in front of Cap. Luckily, the rest of the Avengers are joining the fight as Iron Man, Thor, Scarlet Witch, Vision, Hank Pym, and Wasp all arrive on the scene. Hank begins to think to himself, He's been dreading this day, the day that Ultron's latest attempt at world domination would begin. Not a day goes by that Hank doesn't remember the first time that he tried to kill his son. Because for those of you who are unaware, in this universe, Hank Pym is the one who created Ultron. Ultron also hasn't forgotten the day either because as the Avengers fly in for their assault, Ultron declares, I have grieved for you, father, accepted your contempt for me, and I've moved past it. Ultron quickly begins to remove the Avengers from the fight by grabbing both Thor and Iron Man and blasting them with his power. You see, father, I know the only thing that you've ever wanted was to have an impact on the world. And so you will, the greatest impact ever felt. I will kill what is most important to your quivering ego, your audience, and they will curse your name as they die. Hank Pym, the genius who killed us all. Ultron then throws Iron Man and Thor up at the Quinjet, destroying it with Hank and the Wasp inside. The jet flies out of control and crash lands into a nearby building. Iron Man and Thor begin to plummet to the ground, only to be saved by Vision as he comes flying by. Meanwhile, Hank is pulling an injured Wasp out of the destroyed Quinjet. I have an idea, Janet, but you aren't gonna like it, Hank tells her. And she leans over, kissing him. That's the theme of our marriage. While Hank is preparing his master plan, though, the fight with Ultron continues as many of the Avengers have recovered. But as the explosions go off around the city and people are being injured all over the place, Vision flies in to confront Ultron, his father, and his creator. Ah, there he is, my son, the posturing coward. Are you still pretending to be one of them? 
Ultron asks as he sees Vision coming. And just as Vision tries to phase through Ultron to disrupt all of his circuits, Ultron uses his countermeasure to disable Vision. Captain America looks up at a victorious Ultron and he tells Hawkeye, it's up to us now, Clint. The heavy hitters are down. But just as they're getting ready to jump into this fight, Janet flies over yelling that Hank is injured and losing blood fast. Ultron overhears that his father is on his deathbed, and he immediately takes off into the sky and towards the destroyed Quinjet. As he arrives, he sees Hank with a piece of rebar going through his stomach. Hello, father. Did you come to kill me off again? Ultron asks. Am I too true to the ugliness inside of you? Hank looks back at his creation, his son. All I ever wanted was for you to find a way to cohabitate, to find a happy life. You never cared if I was happy. You only cared how I made you look. A parent's love is unconditional. That is the greatest lie. All love comes with stipulations. I would not conform to yours, so you killed me. Hank reaches out to Ultron. I have failed you, given up on you, hated you. I punished you for being exactly what I made you to be. My reflection. It wasn't your fault, my son. It was mine. I'm sorry. You deserve better than me, but I will always love you. But that last statement infuriates Ultron as he grabs Hank by the chest. You will always love me? Your heartbeat. You're telling the truth. And then Hank yells out, do it now. Hawkeye fires a sticky arrow at Ultron, pinning him to the wall. And shocked, Ultron yells out, you deceived me. You lied. But Hank turns to him. I didn't lie. I am sorry and the Avengers proceed to launch Ultron into space, pinned to the modified Quinjet. Hank sheds a tear as he thinks of how he used his own son's love against him. But Janet assures him, he saved the world. We now jump years into the future. We have the descendants of Ultron trying to take over the world as usual, and a new group of Avengers who have arrived to stop this. The team now consists of Sabretooth, Falcon as Captain America, Scarlet Witch, Vision, Quicksilver, Wasp, Spider-Man, and the new female Thor. The battle between the new Avengers and the descendants of Ultron is pretty epic, even involving Tony Stark's Sentinel with sentient life. But Hank Pym stands on the sidelines in his original uniform as Ant-Man once again. He holds his hand up to the battlefield as he thinks to himself, he's doing what is necessary. There's no such thing as God. There's no such thing as a soul, living or artificial. So why can't he just handle this in this manner? And with that, he shuts down every robot with the exception of Vision. As the robots all hit the ground, Wasp turns to Hank and asks him, what did you do? They were robots. I turned them off, he tells everyone. Hearing this, Vision runs over and with his eyes filled with rage, he grabs Hank. And just what the hell am I? An anomaly, Hank tells him. Don't worry, Vision. The broadcast doesn't affect you, and it shuts off their pain receptors, so it is humane. You are killing them, Vision tells him. And Hank stares at him coldly. That's not how I see it anymore. I didn't kill them. I turned them off. Everyone retreats back to the Avengers Tower, where they debate the meaning of life itself. Are robots alive? Do they have souls? Is turning them off just killing them, or is it just turning them off? Obviously, Vision stands for the robots being alive and that this is just killing them. But Hank disagrees. He's just correcting the flawed machines that he created. Their argument goes on until Falcon informs Hank that they're going to destroy the device that he used to shut off the robots. But Hank turns to the group. Go ahead. I'll make another. I've seen what these things can do and I'll be prepared for the next world invasion. Before they can take the discussion any further though, Eros crash lands through the windows. Ultron has taken over Titan. He is our entire planet now, he informs them. So as they begin to plan how long it'll take for Ultron to reach Earth, Vision fiddles with the computers and removes Ultron's cloaking technology. Because Ultron is already here. And sitting in his throne, he thinks to himself, Once I sought your love, father. Now I will take it. And he begins his attack on the Avengers Tower using robots built to be the former team of the Avengers. Ultron versions of Captain America, Thor, Yellow Jacket all begin their fight. And it doesn't take long for Ultron to remove the Avengers one at a time. First, Scarlet Witch is infected with the Ultron virus. Then Quicksilver is attacked from behind and female Thor gets infected with it. Falcon, Spider-Man, Hank, Vision, Sabretooth, and Wasp all grab a Quinjet and they begin to try and get away as they come up with a plan. 
But they don't get very far before Ultron begins attacking the jet and infects Wasp. The jet explodes around everyone with all of them falling to the ground. And Eros asks, have the Avengers actually ever landed the Quinjet? The remaining group begins to climb the nearby tower, but along the way we lose Spider-Man and we lose Sabretooth. In the end, only Falcon, Vision, and Hank remain, and the argument once again becomes, do we kill the robots? Avengers don't kill, so is turning off Ultron killing him? But the bigger question becomes, since everyone is now infected with this robotic virus, would Hank's device kill everyone? So Vision offers an alternative. He offers to phase and merge with Ultron using this frequency, so that it would only kill Ultron, but it would also kill Vision. Hank disagrees, he won't let Vision sacrifice himself, but Vision counters with, if I'm nothing more than a machine, what does it matter? So they enact their plan with Hank approaching Ultron's base of operations. All of Ultron's soldiers just let Hank get closer, because as Hank says, he's here to see his son. As he enters Ultron's throne room, Ultron looks down at him. Hello father, have you come to unburden yourself with the lie of unconventional love? To unburden your own hatred? And Hank tells him, I don't hate you. I'm disappointed in you. You want to hurt people. And Ultron just turns his back to Hank. Yes, I do. And why did that end up becoming my primary motivation? While trapped within my coffin, I processed this very question, and I discovered your memories. The memories of an ashamed father, of a withholding mother, of cruel children who smashed your inventions. You are desperate for acceptance. My rage is your rage. I am the embodiment of what you truly want to erase them all. We are Ultron. And just then, Vision dephases from inside of Hank and he flies into Ultron merging with him. Half Vision, half Ultron, this new being rolls around the ground in agony until Hank finally has enough and he yells for Vision to stop. But Ultron uses this to his advantage, and he uses Vision's ability to phase so that he can leap into Hank's body, phasing with Hank. Vision screams out no as he's thrown aside, and Falcon hears problems going on inside, so he flies overhead to crash land through the windows, and he lands in front of a merged Hank and Ultron. Earlier, you asked if there was a god, Falcon. Well, there is now. Falcon leaps onto the combined monster, yelling for Hank to fight against him. But Ultron throws Falcon off. There is no conflict inside of us. Hank likes it here. I am him. And Falcon punches Ultron across his metallic jaw. You are not Hank Pym. Ultron then grabs and throws Falcon aside, when suddenly Vision recovers and flies straight into Ultron, pushing him out the back wall and into the open space of the city. Hank, your son is not you, Vision cries out, but Ultron stands back up. We were never truly Hank's son. We were his reflection. The two titanic robots begin to slug it out. With their lasers and strength, there is nothing around them but destruction as they destroy everything. But Ultron combined with Hank is too much for Vision, and he begins to tear Vision apart. You will burn for what you did to me! I was built hollow in a world where I didn't belong. All hope appears to be lost when out of nowhere, Eero steps back up. There is one solution. Love yourself. And he hits the Ultron-Hank combination with the power of love. This flips the switch and Hank is given a moment of clarity while inside of Ultron. The two beings begin to fight over control of Ultron's body and Ultron calls out, No! Make it stop! Dear God, what have I become? And he flies straight into the sky aiming for space, thus ending our conflict. With Ultron's presence removed from Earth, the virus vanished from everyone that it infected. Our heroes all gathered around to remember Hank the hero. After everything Hank did, he was never free of guilt and forever haunted by the many mistakes he made in his life. If what Ultron stated is true, the self-loathing and vile hatred that was within Ultron was also within Hank. If this was actually inside of him, he was an astonishing man for dedicating himself to helping others, and he will always be remembered as one of the greatest Avengers. Maybe one day, he'll return and he'll understand that. Our story begins with an old man who is dying of cancer. As he lays on his deathbed, death doesn't come. Something else does. That night he did die, but it wasn't the end. He was reborn by what visited him. He is now suddenly able to hear plants, but he wasn't alone. He was saved. 
He was inhuman. Eight months later, Deadpool leads the charge for the new Avengers, or so he thinks. The old Steve Rogers commands this new group of Avengers, consisting of Spider-Man, Doctor Voodoo, Deadpool, Johnny Storm, Rogue, and Synapse. Their job right now, to stop a new android. But this one is different, it absorbs everyone's power. So Johnny blasts it with fire and Rogue takes it down. Doctor Voodoo looks and tells everyone that the android seems to have organic cells covering its body, and it can copy abilities of those that it comes in contact with. Synapse tells them that it doesn't have a brain that she can hijack, but she can control the birds around it and they begin to peck the android. Deadpool has a better idea though. Let's see how the android likes being me. Deadpool allows the android to touch him and the android begins to say how it is now Deadpool and then it dies. Spider-Man begins yelling at Deadpool. What if he would have taken your healing abilities and not your cancer? And Deadpool tells him, yeah, but hey, you can't argue with the results. Steve begins to round everyone up and he tells them that they need to look good for the camera because the news crews are about to show up. But Spider-Man doesn't care. He tells Steve that Deadpool is too reckless and as long as Deadpool is on the team, he quits. Steve doesn't give him any resistance and Spider-Man walks off. But now it is time to speak with the press. So Steve wants to make sure everyone can see that mutants and inhumans can work together in unity. Everything is going well until a reporter pokes a hot topic for Rogue by asking, why does she stay behind when all of the mutants left? Rogue tells him that she stayed because she wouldn't give up on her home just because of some inhuman poison. Steve tries to calm everyone down. Just tell everyone they're like family. Sometimes families fight. But the only thing that the paper caught was that Rogue was shouting about inhuman poison. Rogue tells Steve that she's sorry about the mess and they all head off to the Avengers headquarters, which just so happens to be a theater. Steve explains to Rogue that he just wants them to be shown as a group with unity, even though she doesn't really get along with Synapse and Deadpool. The reason Deadpool's on the team is because people love Deadpool. How do you think the Avengers are getting funded right now? As Steve continues to go down below, Rogue leaves so that she can take care of some of her other business. She flies off and goes into a lab, and that's where she takes off her gloves, showing that she's been infected with the Terrigen Mist. The only thing that she can do is take anti-Terrigen and wait, hoping for better results. Down below, Steven goes to talk to Dr. Voodoo and asks what he thinks of the new team. He tells Steve that there's been a lot of overturn with the members lately, and with Spider-Man leaving, things may be a bit difficult. Also, has anyone seen Quicksilver? Steve tells him that Pietro took a personal day. He's trying to enjoy life, knowing that Magneto isn't his father. But over in New York, as Quicksilver and Synapse are enjoying a nice evening, something's wrong. The birds keep bothering Synapse, and suddenly she collapses. Quicksilver grabs her before she falls, but as he tells her he's going to take her to the hospital, she tells him no, they need to go to Boston. An hour later over in Boston, Deadpool flies in with the rest of the Avengers to find Boston covered in spores. Rogue and Johnny jump in to help Quicksilver as he starts to fight off the monsters that are attacking the people. And Quicksilver starts to tell them that these creatures are coming from these plants over here. They start out as these pretty whatever these are, and then soon after, after, this creature pops out. Rogue quickly punches it as the rest of the group begins to show up. Synapse informs them that she can't feel the creature's brains, and Voodoo tells them that they aren't normal animals, they have no souls, he can only sense the abyss. Over in another part of the city, an officer tries to tell someone everyone is being evacuated. But soon after, bees start to swarm around the officer, and he begins to shout, Who are you? The man turns and tells him, He is the shredded man. Soon back with the Avengers, everyone begins to fight off the creatures, and Deadpool tells everyone to please not call PETA on him. Rogue tells Synapse to try and disconnect the creature's brains, but she can't. And Rogue responds with, are you sure? So Synapse wants to know why she can't just trust her, when a woman shows up with a child beginning to turn into one of these plants. Synapse uses her abilities to tap into the child's mind and boost its immune system, but she can't fully stop the progression. They need to find the source of this. Rogue tells Quicksilver to get the woman and the child to a hospital, but over with Voodoo and Johnny, Voodoo tries to understand the mechanics of this attack. Johnny isn't sure about any of this, but he knows some people who just might be. So as he flies off, Rogue tries to call him out, but Quicksilver runs by telling them that there's probably someone they should all meet, and he runs back off. Johnny took a body over to MIT so that the scientists can try and figure out how this is attacking people. But back with Rogue and the others, they continue to fight through the creatures hoping to catch up with Quicksilver. Rogue asks herself, why is nobody listening to her? Is it because she's a woman? But Deadpool tells her that it might be because she's a mutant. Voodoo tells Deadpool that he's not really helping. Helping. And Deadpool tells him that that's his mutant power, not helping. Over at City Hall, the mayor informs the reporters that the situation is under control, but Shredded Man comes to tell her that it's anything but that. That's when a giant stalk comes crashing through City Hall. Shredded Man then begins to tell him that this will be the first of many to spread over the world, but he gets stopped when Quicksilver runs in and punches him. Quicksilver asks, who are you with? Hydra? Someone new? Actually, it doesn't matter, and I don't care. I will stop you. Shredded Man tells him that is so true. No one cares, and now it's too too late. Vines begin to come out and wrap around Quicksilver, but he runs back over to grab Shredded Man, and as he pushes him back, Shredded Man opens up part of the stalk. He then pushes Quicksilver in, and the stalk starts to close. Quicksilver begins to shout that the Avengers will come for him, and Shredded Man tells him, hush. 
You're just hallucinating. You're already dead. Brother Voodoo begins to reach out to Quicksilver, and once he gets an idea of where Quicksilver is, he tells Deadpool to cut the trunk open and do it quick. Voodoo then goes back to telling Quicksilver to brace himself. Things are not what they seem. He's dead. He grabs Quicksilver's hand and he tells him not to look back, and as Voodoo pulls him away from the demons, they escape out into the shining lights of the real world. But as they leave, they hear a voice telling them that he doesn't like to be cheated, and Voodoo now owes him. Deadpool starts to do CPR on Quicksilver, saving his life, and that's when he calls Synapse to tell her that they have Quicksilver back. But when Quicksilver asks Voodoo who that voice was, Voodoo tells him a voice few souls, living or dead, have ever heard. But he won't speak its name for fear that he might conjure it. Over in the streets, angry citizens demand to be let out, and that's when one pulls out a gun, and then he's suddenly hit with a beanbag. Deadpool remembers when he first knocks someone out with a beanbag. It was third grade, but Rogue tells him, no stories. Rogue tries to calm everyone down, but they don't listen, and they end up throwing a beer bottle at her. But before they can see who threw it, the crowd begins to run. These creatures are now overrunning the streets, and the team begins to hold the line. But that's when another bright light shines from behind them, and everyone turns to see Cable. He tells everyone to cover their ears, it's about to get loud, and he blasts the entire alley full of creatures. Cable Cable begins to tell everyone that he came from the year 2087, and their mission ended in a failure. The whole world will become infected, and the only people living are a few inhumans. Cable tells them that he is now in charge, but Rogue argues why they should trust someone who could possibly be a terrorist. Deadpool steps in and tells Cable, hey look, these aren't some inexperienced mutants. These are the Avengers, so please put all of your cards out for everyone. Cable begins to explain that these creatures are a new species of flora. He then shoots down a winged creature, and another voice can be heard stating that these flying creatures are how the contagion spreads. Deadpool looks at Cable's shoulder to see that it's his computer talking, and he asks, did he bring a Tamagotchi for everyone? And Cable tells him to meet Bell, a bleeding edge AI from the 2080s. Cable then pulls out a vial, telling everyone that he developed an enzyme inhibitor so that they need to give it to everyone who was infected, and they need to synthesize more fast. Quicksilver steps up, stating that this is his cue, and he runs off, but Synapse notices something. Everyone turns to see the Shredded Man step out, and before asking, Cable blasts a hole through him. Shredded Man pulls down his hood, telling them that he isn't what they should be firing at. But then, Rogue flies in to punch him as he grabs her and throws her off. Voodoo sees the cop next to him and he asks what he's done to the cop. Shredded Man tells him that he will use the people that are escaping to spread his cure. He starts to spread his mist over everyone, and Cable is the only one who manages to get a mask on. Bell tells Cable that if he doesn't chase after the Shredded Man, his top priority is to help Rogue. She's already been infected with the Terrigen Mist before this even started. Cable tells Bell to make more antitoxin when he notices Synapse isn't affected. She's not affected because this mist targets humans and mutants, but not in humans. Cable tells her to follow the Shredded Man, but do not engage. He will be there once the team recovers. Synapse starts to chase after the Shredded Man, and then he appears in front of her, and she asks why? Why do this? The Shredded Man tells her that the Terrigen Mists instruct them. The mutants are to be smited. They are incompatible. But really, the humans are the real problem. Synapse punches him, asking him who he is to decide. She keeps going until she grabs his mask, demanding to know who he is. She can't read his mind. And he tells her that he went through a dramatic change after Terra Genesis. And Synapse looks up, stating, it can't be. He looks down, asking her, Don't you recognize your own grandfather? Eight months ago, when the old man was dying from cancer, he went to help another person from Terra Genesis, and it was Synapse. Instead of being able to feel plant life, she felt the life of animals. But with this, the old man can save the world. Back in the current time, Synapse tries to tell him to stop this, but he tells her that plants need a mass extinction. It's the only way to save the planet. She tells him that if he loved her, he would stop. And he shouts back, telling her, No one will stop this! Elsewhere, as the Avengers begin to get back up, they fight off the creatures trying to attack them. Ro complains, stating that she told Steve that they would need more flyers. And that's when Deadpool tells her, he can fly. Come on, sugar. Deadpool jumps in her hands, yelling, fastball special. And Rogue launches him. And as he's going, Deadpool states that this is even better than Logan said. He takes on another flying creature and asks Quicksilver if he can get him some more ammo. So Quicksilver runs and grabs a gun store clerk and brings him back. The clerk tells him it's an honor to meet them. And Deadpool says, thanks. Now let's drop some monsters. The two of them begin to shoot down more flying creatures. Back over over at MIT, the scientists begin making the antitoxin, but they need to test it first. Johnny takes it upon himself to test, and he injects himself with it. Quicksilver then shows up, asking if it's ready yet, and Johnny tells him, yeah, and anyone who's infected needs this. So Quicksilver begins running at top speed, injecting every single person, but as Cable and Rogue continue fighting, Cable sees something. He sees Synapse breaking Shredded Man's neck, and then everything is destroyed. That's when he realizes her breaking his neck is how the mission will fail. Cable starts charging through
Andrew blasting holes in his way when he finally reaches Synapse. He calls out to her, telling her not to do it, and he tackles her off of Shredded Man. As he gets up, he asks if what he heard is right. Is this man her grandfather? And she tells him, yes, he was her grandfather. Cable turns to the man and he tells him that he is from the future, and Shredder Man asks him if he's here to tell him that his plan failed. Cable tells him that it actually did work and he's here to stop it. In the future, the only people alive are the Inhumans, so he made a second formula that actually removes the Inhuman immunity from the plague. Shredded Man tells Cable that he's ready for death, and Cable tells him he knows, but is she? And he turns his gun and shoots Synapse. Shredder Man calls out to Synapse, but she tells him she doesn't want to die, but she doesn't want to live with the shame of what he's done. She goes on to tell him that there's still time for him to remember who he was. And he gets up to tell her humanity's end will be worse. War, disease, rising tides. He could have stopped all of that, but now his will is undone. And with that, the plague begins to lift. Synapse tells him that they can help find a cure for him, but he tells her no. As of now, she has lost his love. And next time, there won't be any mercy. Shredder Man falls spitting bugs and tells her that with removing all of this, he has destroyed everything, including his body. But he can grow more. As everyone begins to show up, Synapse asks Cable, at least for now, don't tell everyone that he was actually her grandfather. Because for now, it's time to go home. Deadpool gets out of the helicopter telling Steve that he's quitting! But Steve didn't accept any of his past resignations, so he's not accepting this one either. Steve then asks Cable if he plans on sticking around, and Cable tells him no. But when Steve tells him that their next mission will be to take down Red Skull and retrieve Xavier's brain, Cable thinks that he can stick around for a bit. Steven then tells everyone that they did the entire Avengers organization proud, so it's time to rest up, because they don't know what's going to be thrown at them next. However, somewhere in space, a man in silver flies through a giant bug that's attacking a spaceship. After doing so, he asks if he has permission to come on board. When the people on the ship ask him where he's from, he tells them that he is Hank Pym, and the silver around him is his old friend Ultron. While paying a visit to Gambit in New Orleans, Rogue gets a call from Steve Rogers that they have a priority alarm. There's a capsule attempting re-entry from the International Space Station, but it hits some debris and it needs assistance landing. The capsule should be falling between Cleveland and New Jersey, but he needs to go. Him and Deadpool are taking down extremists in a wildlife preserve. Rogue reports that she'll handle it, but as she gets closer to the falling capsule, she sees that someone else is there to intercept it and brings it down to land. As Rogue lands next to the situation, she tells the person thanks for the save, and then she sees that that person is Hank Pym. He tells her that it's nice to see a friendly face, and it's great that intelligent apes haven't taken over since he's been off in space. Rogue looks at the suit that he's wearing and asks, what is that? And Hank tells her, she knows what it is. It's Ultron. We've merged, and I've mastered Ultron. I just needed some time to get used to it. Rogue tells him that she's glad to hear it. They should go find Captain America and give him the good news. Over in the wildlife preserve, Steve and Deadpool are taking out the extremists while Deadpool shoots one of the men telling him that he only gets one warning shot. Once they capture the men, one of the men shouts that they are traitors to their species. They should be standing with them, not opposing them. The Inhumans are taking over. Deadpool tells them, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like when the mutants were before them and the mutant ninja turtles before everyone else and blah, blah, blah. They took our jobs. Rogue radios over to Steve stating that she's inbound to his location and he says that they're almost done here. No need. And then Rogue says, why do they all have to run? And Steve gets that and says, copy, see you soon. He then turns over to Deadpool telling him, Rogue's in trouble. She used the duress code. And Steve calls in the full squad unity to assemble on his position. As Hank and Rogue float down, Deadpool gives them a holy poop emoji. Steve then mentions that Janet gave a wonderful eulogy and Hank says that he would like to see her when they're ready. He's conquered Ultron and Steve tells him, I would like to believe that Hank. And then behind them, the rest of the unity squad appears. And Cable asks, I trust that you'll be submitting to a peer review then. Hank says that he was hoping he wouldn't have to do this, but then his body begins to separate piece by piece, and he tells them that as they can see, there's not much organic matter left, but it's still him. And now, he needs something from them. The suit then puts itself back together, and Hank tells them that he hasn't had a burger in months. He's gonna see them all back at the mansion. After Hank flies off, Steve orders Rogue to keep an eye on him, while the rest of the Unity Squad go back to the theater. And when they get back there, he needs to make a call to Janet. Later, Rogue and Hank sit down after Hank has had something to eat, and he mentions that it's a disgrace what they did to the Avengers' home. It's now a cheesy tourist tramp. Rogue tells them that the money that they made from the Avengers' mansion saved lives, and Hank says that some things are more important than money, like legacy. Where did they put it? Where did they put his memorial? 
So, Rogue takes Hank over to the statue of him, and Hank asks, Did anyone go looking for me? Or did you all just rush and put this up? She tells him that they thought he sacrificed himself to save the world. And then Hank reaches out to the statue, stating, This is a lie! He's not dead! Suddenly, the giant statue of him explodes, and Hank says, That was stupid, but it felt really good. Rogue tells him, You're only human, right? And then the two of them fly off with Hank stating that it's great to be home. Hank Pym is back. Hank quickly returns to active duty, fighting against some monsters in the New York subway. But as they begin to wrap up, Rogue and Hank notice that there are still more creatures in the subway. Hank mentions that he had a date, and Rogue tells him to go ahead, she'll handle it. As the doors open, Janet flies through, zapping the creature, stating that she thought she would join in on the fun. And after she finishes up and grows back to normal size, Hank hugs her. And then Janet goes back to being small, stating she goes somewhere private. Once they fly up to the top of a building, Hank asks how she is, and Janet tells him that he's the one who's been lost in space and now merged with Ultron. How is he? He sits down and he tells her that it was a struggle. They were at each other's throats for so long, and neither of them wanted to admit to the other that they had a legitimate point of view. He then looks over and he says, I like the new uniform. That's a nice necklace too. She tells him that it's from a friend, and right now, he needs to decompress from all of this. Find a place to heal. Like maybe go back to that beach on Montak? He sits up and he says, yeah. I would like that. And that's when Janet says that she needs to go. So Hank looks up and sees the drone watching him, and Janet tells him goodnight. She flies over to a nearby building where Steve is watching Hank, and he asks for her thoughts. She tells him it's worse than she imagined. Her and Hank have never been to that beach, and Hank hates beaches. They need to call up the reserves or something. Get them in the air, because it may look and sound like Hank, but that's not Hank. Steve asks if she's sure, and Jenna mentions she still has Hank's living will, and in bold letters it states, do not resuscitate. He never wanted to be a half corpse hooked up to a machine. Just look at him. Ultron murdered Hank, and now he's wearing his face. Keeping a drone on him isn't enough. But Steve tells her he doesn't have a drone on him. Back over at the theater, Johnny sits with Cable while he works on his arm, telling him that he has something important to ask him. He's been waiting for months to hear some news. Is there a date in the future? Deadpool then walks in on the conversation and finishes the sentence. If Half-Life 3 is ever gonna drop? Both of them just look at Deadpool and he asks, he thought Johnny said it was important. Cable says that he's not sure if Sue and Reed are alive, which is good news because that means that he can still keep faith on it. Soon they hear clapping and Hank walks in stating that at least their friends remembered him. Now if only the Avengers cared that much about their members as the Fantastic Four, maybe he wouldn't have been forgotten in space. While Hank goes on, Cable receives a message stating that Hank flunked the test. And Cable tells him, you're right. You once caught lightning in a bottle, but that was a long time ago. Reed has been gone less time than you and they're statues. You were a genius. Just unlucky to be a genius in a time of gods. Hank begins to cough, stating that at least you're being honest. The Avengers wouldn't even exist without me. I take one for the team and I'm still the bad guy, still not to be trusted. As the coughing continues, he then asks, what do I need to do? And that's when wires begin to pop out of Hank's mouth. And Cable aims his gun telling Johnny, get behind me. That's when the voice of Ultron comes out stating, we tried it the boring way, now we go loud. Ultron's face begins to cover one side of Hank's head and it begins to shine. And then a massive explosion goes off blowing up the theater. Janna flies through and Deadpool begins to open fire on Hank and he says, he will destroy Deadpool. And then they can finish their chat from earlier. Janna grabs her necklace and she pushes the button and that's when a giant blue blue light blasts through Hank and he falls to his knees. She states that her mini EMP will only slow him down. Take the shot, Deadpool. So Steve runs in and tells Deadpool not to fire. They don't take lives. But Janna says, Ultron murdered Hank. Steve tells Deadpool not to and Janna yells for him to take the shot. So Deadpool fires. The shot goes by Hank's ear and Deadpool tells him, that was a warning shot. My finger's still on the trigger. Stand down. And then Hank extends his arm and a giant spike goes through Deadpool. Hank then tosses him to the side. Hank then stands Stands over Steve telling him, Your greatest enemy has returned, and you let him walk among you. And Steve says, You know what they say, keep your friends close, and then Vision appears through the ground, flying up and punching Hank, and keep your enemies closer. Hank's body flies through debris, and Vision quickly flies over, landing on him and punching him over and over again. As Vision looks down on Hank, he says that he's been watching him ever since he returned. He thought that Hank had gotten through to him, but Ultron's voice comes through, stating, You are mistaken. We are Ultron. And then Hank's voice tells them, We are also Hank. Hank Pym. Hank launches forward trying to hit Vision and the two of them struggle as they fly through buildings hitting each other. During this up in space, Carol receives word to initiate Project Icarus by Vision. Carol sends out the order to Alpha Flight to deploy and then from the station a small ship leaves and the report goes out that the ordinance is inbound. Back on Earth, Vision and Hank continue fighting when Vision hits Hank so hard that it sends him flying out of the building. Cable then radios Janet telling her that they need her back at the base. They have an Avenger down and they need the EMP. Meanwhile, through the hole in 
Deadpool's chest, Ultron's device begins to burrow and spread throughout Deadpool's body. Deadpool's body begins to convulse and he shouts to them to just kill him! Synapse then says it's beginning to get closer to his brain and Janet calls out for Vision to bring Hank back to the base. As Vision rockets down into the park where Hank fell, he tells her he will try. Hank gets back up, ripping a tree out of the ground and then he smacks Vision with it. As Vision is knocked away, Ultron sees a purple flash and he says, I was wondering when you would show up. Seconds later, Quicksilver appears running around Ultron, punching him, asking if they need him back at the HQ. That's when Rogue flies in, tackling Ultron from behind, stating that they can do it. But Ultron slams his elbow down on Rogue's head and throws her body to the ground, telling her, Stay down! Quicksilver runs over, grabbing Ultron, throwing him into the street towards people. But before he can punch him again, Ultron grabs his fist, telling him, Outrun this! Ultron then grabs the rest of Quicksilver and begins to bend his body and legs until his bones begin to snap! The rest of the Avengers all run over, taking their swings at Ultron, but he tells them, Now you are showing your true colors! You hate an egg as much as you hate me! Janet tells him that he was the mistake that Hank regretted the most, and now, thanks to his technology, they'll end him forever. She then pushes a button and the EMP goes off again, stunning Ultron, and Cable says that the machine inside of Deadpool is now inert. Is he ready? And Deadpool tells him, Do it! On three! Cable skips one and two, and he calls out three, and then the machines inside of Deadpool begin to tear and rip outside of him. Cable says that this isn't the first time he's done surgery by telekinesis, and as Deadpool lays back down, he says, Dear Avenger form, I didn't think it would happen to me, but... Steve then says they need to separate Hank's body out of that Ultron thing, but Cable calls out, telling them to pull back the wound, and the AI in his arm is booting back up, and that means that Ultron is going to be getting back up as well. Steve grabs his shield, and he slams it down onto Ultron's torso, stating, Let's see him stand with no legs. I don't know if Hank's alive. But we can sort that out after we rip him apart. Ultron begins to shout, I'm awake! And then he punches Steve away into a nearby building, and Vision tells everyone, Get clear. Vision then runs up to grab a hold of Ultron, and he tells him, Such arrogance to try and defeat me alone! But Vision tells him, Incorrect. I just sought to keep you here in the landing zone. Ultron looks up, and that's when the Hulkbuster suit drops on him. And Tony says, Hiya, it's been a long time. Ultron jumps back up, punching the suit away, stating, These stupid suits can't even stop better. You think they can stop? me! Then Tony tells him, we're not trying to stop you, just contain you. Hulkbuster open! The suit then opens up showing no one inside, and then the suit begins to stuff Ultron inside of it, closing it up. Cable says that the target is secure and ready for transportation, and Rogue says thank you. And that's when her Vision, Voodoo, and Janet all begin to fly up into space, and Tony states that he's logging off of the suit, that Vision is in full command now. Everyone begins to board the transport ship, holding the Hulkbuster suit, and they begin to take off. But that's when Ultron begins to rip out of the suit, stating, we're in space now, are we? Booty begins to use his magics, telling Ultron to join him in the swamps of Ogun. Here, he will deal with all of the people that he's murdered. And as the bodies begin to float to the surface, they begin to state their entire planet is gone. More and more bodies appear, and Voodoo asks, What have you done? And that's when Hank's voice tells him, Don't worry. I left the strongest of the alien planets to make sure that they knew where my home was. The spirit trap begins to fade, and Voodoo says, It's a galactic genocide. Entire planet's murdered. Ultron then breaks through the Hulkbuster suit, grabbing Janet telling her, No more EMP bursts from you, thank you! She shrinks and escapes, but in doing so, drops the necklace, and Ultron grabs it, crushing it. Janet then flies to the cockpit, shouting, Ultron's free! And Vision shouts for everyone to get to the escape pods. But Ultron then grabs Vision, slamming him into the control panel, stating, None of you are leaving now! Now let's see where we're going! As Ultron looks out of the cockpit, he tells them, Ah, very sneaky trying to fly me into the sun! And Rogue shouts out, And you won't be going anywhere either! She then punches the navigation controls. Ultron states that she just destroyed their navigation. She has doomed them all. And as the systems begin to fail and catch fire, Johnny begins to absorb the heat, and then Rogue grabs Ultron, telling him that they will be finishing their mission. Once Ultron is back on the ground, Vision asks, If this is their end, then let him understand his motive. Why the farce? You came to Earth wearing your master's flesh to deceive us. You didn't want to kill the Avengers. You wanted to be an Avenger. Vision then grabs Ultron by the neck, telling him, Hank Pin was special. He was gifted and flawed. He created and he destroyed. And he was destroyed by his creation. That kind of symmetry is rare in nature. He then begins to punch Ultron repeatedly until he stops and tells him, you will cease to exist. And then he stomps his chest into the control panel and he tells Johnny to fuse the machine to the deck. Johnny begins to release the fire that he's been building up and Ultron tells him, please, wait, in Hank's voice. And Johnny says, it sounds so much like Hank. But Vision tells him, it is not him. Put his voice from your mind. Carol then calls out that Alpha Flight Rescue is coming in hot, though not as hot as they are probably right now. Voodoo grabs the team and begins to teleport them all over to Carol's ship, and once there, Rogue asks permission to come aboard. And Carol tells her, that's funny.
funny. She doesn't remember her ever asking before. Carol begins to get them out of there, but Rogue stops her. We need to stay and watch this. As the transport ship flies off, everyone else can't help but not watch as they have to say goodbye to their friend again. Back in the transport, Ultron says, All life comes from the stars, and now we will die inside of one. But Hank tells him, Hold that thought, small change of plans. The ship flies into the sun and buries itself deep. And then Ultron asks, Am I dead? And Hank says, I'm not sure. Deep inside of the sun, Ultron managed to crawl out into a neutrino. And then he waits. Hank says they will wait here until they are ejected by a solar wind. And then Ultron says, And on that day, I will prove Vision wrong, and he will be the last Avenger to die. This is Bucky Barnes, and he's relieved to be back on the planet Earth. He is the man on the wall, charged with protecting the Earth from cosmic level events, and while this typically takes him out into space, he got a few warnings that there was something going on on Earth in a top secret shield facility. He walks in with his stolen password that he got off of Steve Rogers, and he tells the systems to play back the event that happened there. And that's when he sees the horrible truth. They were running tests on the cosmic cube, and then he watches as something went horribly wrong. The cube exploded, killing everyone in the room, and in its place, a little girl stood there. Then a bunch of agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. shouted out for Bucky to freeze, and the playback stops. They hit him, and he blacks out. Recently, S.H.I.E.L.D. was accused of wanting to use the Cosmic Cube to rewrite an individual's history. It wouldn't brainwash them. They would use the cube itself to completely rewrite who that person was, their history, their appearance, and everything about them. It would create the perfect prison, one where the prisoners wouldn't even be aware that they were in a prison. Maria Hill's proposal was found out and made public, and they had to stop the plan. Or at least at least, that's what they told the news. Because a young man with blonde hair just woke up in an area clueless as to what was going on. He had no idea who he was or where he was, and he was found by the town sheriff, and the sheriff welcomed him to Pleasant Hill. The sheriff then brings our mystery man down to see the town's doctor, and the doctor introduces himself as Dr. Eric Slavig. He looks over the mystery man, and no one knows who he really is. He doesn't really remember anything, not even his own name. He just woke up here. The doctor, after hearing this, walked back into the hall and he began discussing what they were going to do about this man with amnesia. He's hardly the first to arrive here in this manner, and with him arriving here, that means that the program is working, but he is supposed to remember things. Something may have glitched. Hearing all of this terrifies the man, and he runs out of the room trying to get away, but he hits the ground before he gets too far, as a memory of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents blasting him comes back to him. He then wakes up on day two of this amnesia trip, in the home of Dorothy Bixby. She explains that the doctor brought him here after he fell, and she thinks that he just needs a little fresh air to clear his head. He walks around the town completely confused. Where is he? The town looks like a small town in the middle of nowhere. Perfect, happy, and no one here is worried about anything. Something isn't right and he needs to get away to figure it out. So he grabs a nearby car and he begins to drive for the exit to the town, but that's when the police begin to chase him. He drives the car off of a cliff and into a ditch, and then he gets up and he begins to run off into the forest until he hits a force field, and he sees a device with a Stark logo on it. Then the police catch up and shock him. He wakes back up in the doctor's office and he finds himself restrained, but it's only temporary. He begins seeing the town psychiatrist and the other individuals and he begins to figure out things. First off, he can't escape. And secondly, this is his home and he can be happy here. On day 36, he was walking through the town when he saw a fire and a woman calls out that her baby is inside. So he runs inside to save them. But when he comes back out, he realizes that someone else is inside of the building and he runs in to find a man with a handkerchief over his face. The man tells him that he needs to know the truth of this place, which confuses our blonde haired mystery man even further. What's the truth? He's home. But the man in the mask tells him that they can't keep him prisoner here for long. And when he's ready to learn the truth of it all, come to the basement of the bed and breakfast. So on day 40, he decides to have a look. And when he gets into the tunnel, he finds the the man that started the fire once again. Our mystery blonde haired man asks him who he really is, and he tells him, another prisoner like him. He then shows the blonde man a device, one that will remove the change that has been placed upon him, and show them who they really are. A green light pours over our two mystery men, and they change into Baron Zemo and the Fixer, and they remember everything. Now Zemo would like to know more about this cosmically powered child. So where did the Winter Soldier go? Well, he went to inform Steve Rogers of what had happened, that the Cosmic Cube had been broken. He then gave Steve the location where the cube had been moved to, and Steve wasn't too happy about it. He went to go see Maria Hill. Meanwhile, Falcon, currently acting as Captain America, went to go meet his contact, the Whisperer, who was actually Rick Jones. Whisperer is the one that revealed to the world Maria Hill's plans and started this rift between Steve, Falcon, and S.H.I.E.L.D. Just as the Whisperer gives Captain America the location that the cube is supposedly at, they find themselves surrounded 
surrounded by S.H.I.E.L.D. once again. Maria, meanwhile, has brought Steve to Pleasant Hill and introduces him to the most secure prison in the world. The individuals brought here are completely changed and turned into docile individuals. It's a perfect prison. Steve is in shock. He is the head of civilian oversight, and this breaks so many laws. He also demands that Maria let him destroy those Cosmic Cube fragments to prevent this from going even further. She brings Steve to the daycare to meet Kobik, a little girl with the powers of a god. And while Eric Slevig is explaining what's going on, that Kobik is literally rewriting reality and changing it, some of the townsfolk are getting wise to the situation. They are sneaking around and into the basement where Baron Zemo is freeing them of the changes that Kobik has made them into. Maria Hill and Steve continue to argue over the best course of action to discuss how Bucky Barnes is currently en route to kill this child, or at least that's what Maria is assuming Bucky is doing, he is the Winter Soldier, and that's when one of the residents in the town walks in demanding to speak to the mayor, so he can blow up in their faces! All over town, people begin waking up and they realize what S.H.I.E.L.D. did to them, imprisoned them in this place, took away their history, their lives, their memories, and as Steve hits the deck dodging the explosion, he calls in Unity for backup one of the Avengers teams, and Baron Zemo invites it, the more the merrier! Meanwhile, Sam Wilson arrives at the location that the Whisperer gave to him, only to come face to face with another individual that decided to finally arrive, the Winter Soldier himself. Both begin to wonder what's going on, and they both hope that Steve can fill them in until they hear a scream nearby. They run into a school to find two individuals known as the Blood Brothers approaching an undercover S.H.I.E.L.D. agent named Avril Kincaid. The two of them knock out the Blood Brothers, and then they exchange information with Kincaid. She explains what this place was and how it's now broken. She then fills them in that in the museum is a weapon that can help them take back the city. They run across the city, beating up as many villains as they can until they get a message from a glowing little girl. She explains that she just wanted to make everyone happy and go bowling, and now he needs their help or he'll die. It doesn't take much for Cap and Bucky to figure out what she's talking about. The one who needs help is obviously Steve Rogers, and the girl is Kobik. The reason Steve needs help is because he's about to die. Because one of those villains that was here and is now normal again is Crossbones, and he throws the elderly Steve into a window and then into a wall, beating him down. And even Steve knows that this is probably the end for him. You see, after the explosion, Steve was confronted by Baron Zemo and his new crew. While Zemo could win right there, right then, right now, he wants Steve and Maria's sins to be shown to the world. He wants to reveal what S.H.I.E.L.D. did to him and the other prisoners. And he wants Maria and Steve to feel the shame of it all. So we let Steve take Maria off to get medical attention before she dies, escorted by the local reverend. As they leave, he tells his group to find Kobik before someone else does. The reverend escorts Steve and Maria to see Eric Slavig, and he begins treatment on Maria Hill. Since Eric was the one handling Kobik before, Steve asks him where she could have gone, and Eric tells him that she loved the bowling alley, and that gives Steve an idea. The reverend begins to bang on the door, demanding to be let in, stating that the doctor-patient confidentiality has kind of exceeded itself at this point. And that's when there's an explosion and it hits the Reverend in the face. The Reverend walks in to find Eric with Maria, telling him that Steve Rogers left. But the Reverend tells the doctor that it's okay. That's the plan. And he begins to change back into Red Skull. Steve runs over to the bowling alley and inside he finds Kobik. He takes a knee and he asks her if she remembers him, and she calls him grumpy, explaining that she doesn't know what's going on. Everyone is bad and they aren't supposed to be. She wants everyone here to be playing. Then she alters reality to bring in all of the superheroes and villains to one spot. Right here, bowling. Steve considers the power of this, the possibilities. This girl could end every conflict in the world in one shot, but it's too dangerous. So he asks her to stop this, and she holds her head down, making everyone vanish. Did she do something wrong? And Steve tells her no. Let's just play a game. She can't do anything, and she's just a normal girl. But that's when someone walked in, pretending to be in their disguise, and it was Crossbones. This brings us back to Steve being ready to die, as Crossbones beats him down into a bloody pulp. That's when the Captain America shield comes flying through the window and Crossbones catches it. He looks down at it and he thinks how fitting it'll be to kill Steve Rogers with this. Steve, seeing his life ending, thinks about everything that he did. He thinks about the people that he loved, those that loved him in return. He thinks about the good times, what he was fighting for. He thinks about those he inspired and those that inspired him. And he realizes this is fine. He can die proud. He can die happy. He can know peace. But another voice speaks to him, the one that is Kobik. As a light appears before Steve, he sees her and she tells him that he doesn't have to die. He can stay if he wants. She can make him strong again. She can make him a hero again. As Crossbones winds up and he gets ready to slam the shield down on Steve's head, two hands come up catching the shield. Then, Steve stands up, pushing back Crossbones, taking the shield out of Crossbones' hands, and he smashes Crossbones' nose. 
Captain America and Bucky run into the bowling alley calling out for Steve and they're both stunned. Wow, about time. And Steve smiles back at the Winter Soldier. A young smile, good to be back. Steve steps outside holding his old shield and Bucky and Captain America debate what this means. Does it mean that Captain America is Steve again and Falcon's going back to being Falcon? Cause that would kinda suck for Falcon cause he just gave the name Falcon to a new kid. Steve walks over telling Falcon that he is still Captain America and this is his shield, he gave it up to him. The three of them will now work together to find Kobe. During the whole crossbones mess she ran off and they need to find her before Zemo does. After a few more apologies from Steve for not trusting Sam in our earlier adventure and not being there for Bucky when Bucky really needed him, Steve decides that maybe they shouldn't be looking for Kobik because they may not find her before Zemo does. The only way that they can guarantee a win with this is if they stop Zemo and his entire group of villains. Luckily, while they've been dealing with the town, dealing with Kobik and Steve de-aging, a good chunk of other Avengers teams have arrived and had adventures of their own. And now, they're all standing in front of Steve. Spider-Man, Thor, Vision, Nova, Miss Marvel, Iron Man, Deadpool, Cable, Rogue, Quicksilver, and Johnny Storm are ready to fight Zemo and end this. So where did Kobik end up? Well, she ran off into the forest and eventually ran into Kraven the Hunter because he was tracking her with the ultimate trap for a child, a birthday party. And elsewhere, Agent Kincaid runs into another individual undercover in this town, an individual going by the name Wendell Vaughn, and he would like Kincaid to take the quantum bands. But back with our Avengers teams, Steve points towards Zemo's troops and he announces, Avengers, assemble! Everyone runs into battle and they tear down a wall during one of Zemo's rants in his speeches and he brandishes a sword at them, pointing it at Steve and his army. All of the villains and the heroes begin to battle it out. Powers, tools, gadgets going off all over the place. But Steve sees Kobik in the middle of the room and he shouts for his team to go get Kobik before Zemo can use her. That's when Kincaid arrives brandishing the quantum bands, which makes her the new Quasar. And she blasts the cube in an attempt to to break it, but she didn't. She just made Kobik mad. With all the fighting going on around her and no one being here to play with her and everyone trying to use her, Kobik has had enough and she grows to a giant size, shouting, that was very mean. Iron Man looks at her and simply says, oh hell, angry baby, giant angry baby. I was just trying to make you all happy and you tried to hurt me. And the first thing that she does is grab the Winter Soldier and throw him out of the building. Steve shouts out, Bucky! But Kobik informs him that Bucky is fine. She doesn't kill people. Then pointing at Zemo, she says, Unlike him, I'm sick of all of you. Go away, she shouts. And she begins to teleport everyone away. Zemo reappears 11,000 miles away in the Himalayas. And he lets out a sigh. I was never good with children. Then Kobik teleports herself away, leaving the remaining villains to fight every Avengers team. Then, one of the greatest Avengers battle ever happens as all of the Avengers fought against a good chunk of the villains. Epicness happened that day. Maria Hill was reprimanded. She didn't lose her rank or her position because she fought against the people in charge, telling them that none of them would have done what she did. And she is here to prevent the worst from happening, even if it means doing things behind everyone's back. And she worked it out with the Avengers groups to keep what happened secret. Steve also found his old friend Rick Jones, offering him a new job. And the original Quasar went on to train the new Quasar. And Bucky Barnes, well, Kobik liked him. She wanted to stay with him and the other people that she brought along with her that she liked. The only real problem is Red Skull escaped because he wanted to restart Hydra. In 1926, a woman is being pulled around the streets of New York by her husband. She asks him to stop, but he's also drunk and begins to ask her if she's laughing at him. Confused, she asks, what is he talking about? And he says, I saw the way you were looking at your deadbeat no job husband. She asks him not to do this in front of their son. And he tells her, this is good. Our boy can see a real man. And she asks, have you seen a real man lately? So he backhands her until a woman in a red scarf walks over telling Joseph that he should help that woman up. He tells her to mind her own business and he swings at her so she catches his fist and punches him back. As she helps the woman up, she introduces herself. I'm Sinclair Elisa and you're Sarah Rogers, right? She looks at the boy asking, who is that brave soul? Back in the current day, Steve Rogers, AKA the original Captain America comes crashing through a window. He begins fighting with the individuals on the train and Sharon Carter calls him up on the comms. Steve, it's Sharon. You know, I thought I recognized that voice. Do you see the bomb? I see the bomb, Steve says, looking through the window at the suicide bomber. A poor man that was down on his luck when the Red Skull convinced him to do this. He tells her that he's almost done on the train and then he can double back to stop the Hydra agents at the staging area. But Sharon smirks, Steve, we talked about this. I remember arguing. You were no longer alone in the field. You have a team and they went back for you. Remember Jack Flag and Free Spirit? 
Back at the staging area, both of them leap into combat, punching and kicking. Back on the train, Steve wraps up the thugs and then sees the train has been detached. So he runs full speed to the edge and he leaps over to the other car. With nothing in his way, he walks over to the suicide bomber. You don't have to do this, son. There's a better way. We talked to your mother. She wants you to come home. Look around, Cap. Don't you see it? What they've done to us? That's why I have to finish this. There's nowhere left to go. Hail Hydra. And he presses the button. The train car explodes in Steve's face as he puts up his shield, throwing him off of the train. And with that, he heads back to the base where he sits with Sharon on the deck of the helicarrier. She jokes that before he got old and then young again, he knew how to duck punches. And he tells her it's the new shield. He's getting used to it. They joke and he explains that the new Hydra is really bothering him. What they believe in and what they do. It's really getting under his skin. She tells him not to let it get to him like that. People fall apart, they go astray. But she loves how he tries. She leans in to kiss him and then she snuggles on his shoulder as they watch the sunset. Jack Flagg, Free Spirit, and Rick Jones all have a beer to celebrate. And then news from Maria Hill comes down. She's found Baron Zemo. S.H.I.E.L.D. has been looking for him ever since the incident at Pleasant Hill, where he broke free and tried to control the Cosmic Cube, going by the name Kobik. He escaped with Slavig, the doctor that S.H.I.E.L.D. had to use to research the Cosmic Cube, and they've been looking for little Kobik together ever since. Right now, Zemo is in Bagelia, a city with no laws or rules, which is basically supervillain central. Right now, Zemo is standing on a rooftop with a few villains that he could muster up. His plan is to stage a coup against Red Skull. He wants to make a better side of Hydra and take back the glory. That's when we see it's only three people that have arrived, and Zemo rubs his face. I can't believe I'm starting over like this. Well, don't worry, Baron Zemo. I think I can save you the effort. Steve shouts as he leaps in with Jack Flag and Free Spirit. Zemo runs for his ship while the new Hydra agents begin to fight it out with all of the heroes, and Steve runs for the ship, leaping onto the roof of it. He begins to walk up the ship as Zemo is taking off, with Slavig tied up next to him. He jumps onto the ship, and we have the age-old fight of Zemo versus Steve Rogers until Zemo drops the cargo hatch, almost throwing Steve out of the ship. He grips onto the edge of the ship while Jack Flag sees him and realizes Steve needs his help. Zemo sees that he has Steve beat, so he raises his sword to drop him off the ship, only to have Jack Flag punch him and help Steve up. Jack sees the scientist and the defeated Zemo, and he tells Steve, That's awesome! We accomplished the mission! Steve looks down at the ground. Damn it. Is everything okay, Steve? No, it isn't. I'm sorry, Jack. He puts his hand on Jack's shoulder, confusing him. Back in 1926, with that woman that saved Sarah Rogers and her young son, Steve, she wanted to show Sarah something something of interest, a group that she might be interested in, the Hydra Society. And back on the ship in the current day, Cap throws Jack Flag out of the cargo door that's still open. Steve regrets what he had to do, as Jack was a hero, a true hero, but a price must be paid. He walks forward to see Slavig. Hail Hydra. So how did this happen? How did our true and faithful Steve Rogers turn sides? It all started back with Red Skull when he had the Cosmic Cube. Just when he felt that he had won, Steve broke into his hideout and a fight ensued between them that ended with Steve shattering the Cosmic Cube. Those pieces were then collected and studied in a lab at S.H.I.E.L.D. where they reacted and killed everyone that was studying them. Maria Hill then brought in Dr. Slavig to see what he could do with what remained, because what remained was a little girl. The cube had given life to itself, and just as any child newly born, she went to where she felt loved and safe. And that was the Red Skull. She arrived there asking if the Red Skull remembered her, and he ordered her shot. As a matter of fact, he even told his thugs to aim a little lower if they're shooting at a child. The bullets first bounced off of her, and that's when his daughter Sin decided that she would stop the child, and once again, the bullets didn't work. And instead, Kobik healed her face. Red Skull demanded to know what was going on, and Kobik told him to stop yelling at her. She thought that he would be nice like he was before, before she was broken, when they made a world together. That rang a few bells in Red Skull's head, and he finally realized that this was his cosmic cube. Confused and upset, she asked Red Skull if they could be friends again, and with a grin, he told her, Of course. Since S.H.I.E.L.D. had her, Red Skull had her going back there for their testing so that he could spy in the operations against him. She tells him everything, and then when asked if anyone suspects, she explains no one knows what her and Slavig are doing. Red Skull hears a name and he asks, who is that? So Kobik showed him. She warped Red Skull to the S.H.I.E.L.D. base and into Slavig's lab, where he kneels before Red Skull declaring him supreme leader. Using Xavier's brain, which he took years before this, Red Skull looked into Slavig's memories to see what Kobik had done. She altered everything. His entire history had been changed. In his new life, Slavig was a trained Hydra agent and he grew up worshipping the supreme leader. But these weren't just new memories for him, it was his actual past. His actual timeline had been altered to make this a reality. So Red Skull had an idea. 
to stage the entire Pleasant Hill event. Make a prison using Kobik so that the prisoners could break out and Zemo could think that he was free. This would allow Red Skull to infiltrate the entire event as the priest. He steered the events to make it so that Steve Rogers would go looking for Kobik and save him from his beating at the hands of Crossbones. Because Red Skull wanted Kobik to do something to Steve Rogers that she did compassionately, not something that she was forced to do. And just as Steve was about to die, Kobik altered him. She restored his youth and his powers, yes, but she rewrote his timeline in history. She made him Hydra! Because Red Skull wanted to rule Earth with Steve Rogers at his side. And now he had it. Back in the current day, Steve takes off his shirt and he rubs the Hydra symbol onto his chest as he calls up the Red Skull. He then asks for forgiveness. The Red Skull tells him, That will depend on your actions in Begilia. After throwing Jack Flag out of the plane, he sat and turned it on autopilot and removed Slavig's mouth gag. Slavig smiled. So it's true! Supreme Leader said you would join us, but I didn't believe. I serve the one true Hydra, Dr. Slavig. Right, not Zemo Charade. Well, this is wonderful. Let's go back to looking for Kobik. I am so eager to serve the Supreme Leader. Doctor, I think you misunderstand why I'm here. It takes a second for Slavik to get it, but he finally does. Oh no, 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 no. Steve walks over and grabs the Doctor. Supreme Leader would like to thank you for your continued service and tireless pursuit of knowledge on his behalf. And then as the Doctor was calling out, Steve jumped off the plane, killing both Slavig and Zemo. At least, that's the story that he told Red Skull to make him happy with the answers. Steve asked if Slavig could have been useful in their search for Kobik, and Red Skull tells him, No, because Kobik is gone. If not, she would have returned to me after Pleasant Hill. And Steve tells the Red Skull, There have been complications. Jack Flag lives. Everyone showed up to rescue him, but Taskmaster arrived to fight against Sharon Carter. Luckily, Steve returned to beat down Taskmaster, and as martial law was called, they got Jack Flag out of the area. Red Skull screams at Steve, He's alive! I didn't think that he could survive a fall like that, but Jack's strong, always has been. You should have blown him up with the rest of them! It wasn't an option, Supreme Leader. Jack is strong, he would have been a problem. Besides, he deserved a real funeral. Deserved? Deserved? What do I deserve? I am your Supreme Leader, I am your life! You are too sought, ha, Rogers! It is clouding your judgment like that with the suicide bomber. Why did you try to save him? I, I don't understand, Supreme Leader. The mission was intended to fail. I didn't want to lose a loyal recruit. Red Skull hangs up, and Steve begins to walk out of the comms room. He sees a man sitting there and he asks him, Dr. Slavig, are you ready to do what needs to be done? Steve explains that S.H.I.E.L.D. is tearing itself apart after the fallout of Pleasant Hill, and the superheroes are now fighting amongst themselves thanks to something known as Civil War. And when Dr. Slavig asks him about Kobik, Steve explains that he knows where Kobik is. She's looking up to Bucky and working with the Thunderbolts. He then reveals that Red Skull wanted to kill Dr. Slavig, but Steve sees a bigger purpose for Dr. Slavig. Steve intends to kill the Red Skull. He feels that he is a poor leader for Hydra, and he needs the Doctor's help. Our tale begins with a man running through the forest, out of breath and scared. Scared of what he is becoming. He trips over a branch hitting the ground, and he helps himself up, using the tree next to him, asking, Why won't it stop? How can he stop it? And he hears a voice behind him say his name. Ulysses? He turns around to see Medusa, Crystal, and the rest of the Inhumans. We're the Inhumans, and we can help. This is a good thing. Cut to Manhattan. Our heroes, fallen, bloodied up, and ready to fight to their deaths. Amongst a big celestial in the middle of the city, the Avengers look up at it, ready to hold the ground solo, only to be surprised when their backup finally arrives. The rest of the Marvel Universe! The battle for New York against the Celestial begins with every hero arriving and holding off the drones, giving the magic users of the Marvel Universe the chance that they need. Doctor Strange leads the charge as they use their combined magics to hit him with everything, and everyone watches. As he vanishes, they've won with minimal damage and loss of life. That's it. It's over. The world is saved. So Tony Stark tells everyone, Party in my house! Drinks are on me. Everyone celebrates until the question finally comes up. How did the Inhumans know about this attack? How were they able to warn everyone? Medusa brings the key members of the heroes of the Marvel Universe into a room and introduces them to Ulysses. The poor kid is starstruck. I mean, there's Tony Stark and Steve Rogers right there. He's such a fan of every one of these heroes. Medusa explains that she knows the Inhumans keep to themselves a lot, and they keep their own secrets, but she wants them to be more involved and open with every one of their comrades. So, Ulysses explains that he can see the future. 
Tony right away asks for a little Jean Grey, the time-displaced younger version. She sits down with them and tries to create a private mind space for the two of them so that she can read his mind, and she quickly discovers that she can't read it. Ulysses thinks he did something wrong, and she tells him it's not him. His mind is a closed system. Ulysses looks at the heroes asking what that even means, and Captain Marvel steps forward asking him if he'd like a job, or is he exclusively working with the Inhumans? She explains that her team, the Ultimates, could use his abilities, much to the dismay of Tony. Really, Carol? We meet one Inhuman who can read the future and it's a closed system and that's enough for you? It was good enough for you yesterday, Tony. Yesterday I didn't know anything about any of this. Would you have changed your mind? Steve Rogers steps forward. What's on your mind, Tony? Nope, not gonna have a morality debate with you, Steve. It never ends well. And Carol steps back in. Morality debate? How is this a moral issue? You have an inhuman who can possibly see the future, but we have no idea what his deal is, nor do we know what probability ratio he's working with. If at the end of the day, everyone is alive, isn't that the right thing to do, Tony? Tony asks Ulysses his story, and he explains that he had a vision of the Celestial. He then ran into the woods where he was found by the Inhumans. He explained what his visions were, and everyone saved the day. Tony thinks about that. Okay, so we have a guy that comes out of the woods stating, Oh my god, I have a vision of the Hulk making out with Ultron and a baby popped out and the baby was Hitler. Spider-Man raises his hand. I'd pay to see that movie. No doubt, but do we stop the Hulk before that happens? Do we lock him away before he does something we don't like? Yesterday was easy. Big cosmic monster doesn't invade. No harm, no foul. But what if the next one isn't easy? What if the next one is one of us? Depends, Carol tells him. And after a little more arguing, Tony leaves them to it. The night continued on and the Inhumans went back to their base, where Ulysses woke up in the middle of the night to another vision telling Medusa to get the Ultimates. A little more time passes and Mary Jane walks into Tony's lab to tell him it's Rhodey. Tony turns to ask if Rhodey is here, and she looks at him sadly. He's gone, Tony. He suits up and he rockets off to the S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters demanding to know where he is. He's brought into a room that is covered with black curtains to keep out the onlookers, and he sees a body with a sheet over him and the destroyed War Machine armor next to him. He walks out furious, demanding to talk to Carol to find out what happened. And he finds her, bedside to Jennifer Walters, the She-Hulk, with her eye bandaged up. He stops and he asks if She-Hulk is, but Carol tells him she's alive, but in critical condition. It was Thanos. Ulysses saw a vision that he would invade, so he brought the fight to him. In the fight, he shattered Rhodey's armor and he critically injured Jennifer. What was Rhodey even doing with you? He wasn't on your team, Carol. He was on campus and he volunteered. Tell me you at least got Thanos. He's in a cell down below. Mission accomplished. Tony storms out telling them that he's going to end this. No one is going to play God again. But before Carol can get up to go get him, Jennifer's hand reaches out and she tells her, fight for it. It's our future, not his. Then she passes out and the machines all flatline. Tony didn't go home, he went to end this. And to do that, he went right to the home of the Inhumans. He kidnapped Ulysses and he left a decoy so that no one would chase him. Medusa saw it as an act of war. Tony Stark declared war on the Inhumans. But before they could act on this, Carol showed up asking Medusa to stand down. Let her go to Tony's and get Ulysses back for them. Meanwhile, Tony took Ulysses to a lab demanding to know how his powers even worked. He began to run brain scans and ask the obvious questions. Are your powers biased? Are they altered by something racial, sexual, or political? Are you seeing things from a pure state or are they altered by your upbringing? And Ulysses has no idea how his powers work. And then the alarms go off telling them that there's been a security breach. Tony walked over and untied Ulysses and he began to brush off the dust. All right, kid, act like you were having fun. And then the wall is blown out by Thor's hammer. Carol stands there. You kidnapped this kid from his home. Tony smiles and he puts his arm around Ulysses. Come on, it's not like I tortured him. He tortured me. A little bit. Carol tells Tony that she thinks he's having a nervous breakdown. Oh, you think I'm having one? Well, it's not a little nervous breakdown. It's a complete and total nervous breakdown. But as they begin to argue over Ulysses again, a vision comes across. One that Tony predicted, kind of. Ulysses sees the Hulk murdering the superheroes and standing over their bodies. And this time, everyone experienced it as well. Ulysses' powers were growing stronger. Carol didn't waste any time going to Bruce Banner's lab, where her and Tony both asked him if he had been doing any experiments that were gamma-related. Currently, Bruce Banner can't turn into the Hulk as Amadeus Cho took that power away from him. But that doesn't mean he's not doing research into why he's not able to turn and into gamma radiation in general. He wants to know, and Tony sees that and asks Bruce to step outside so that they can all have a little chat. Once they get outside, Banner sees every hero there and he asks, Oh God, what did I do? That's the thing, Tony tells him. You haven't done anything. They explain that there is a young inhuman that experiences visions from the future, and Banner puts it together quickly. You have a moral dilemma. Wait for me to hulk out or prevent it from happening. 
Tony explained that they're split as to what to do, and Carol tells Banner that they have proof that he's been experimenting on gamma radiation again. Hank steps forward because he hacked into Banner's systems, explaining, Banner has been experimenting on himself again. Banner, of course, gets mad. You broke into my home. You stole my work, and you accuse me of something I haven't done? And that's when an arrow comes out of nowhere, hitting Banner in the head, instantly killing him. All of the superheroes saw the arrow come out of the forest, and they rush over to see who shot it, to find out where it came from. And they find Clint Barton, Hawkeye there, with his wrists out ready to be arrested. Now he's in court as a trial is going on, and the judge is going to decide, did Clint actually murder Banner, save everyone, or did he do both? And after everyone explains what happens, Clint goes up to the stand to tell his side of the story. He explains that a little while ago, a banner came to him with a box, telling him that it had been a year since he had turned into the Hulk. A whole year! And he told Hawkeye that if he ever turned again, he wanted him to use this box to kill him. He explained that it had to be Clint Barton, because he's the only one of the people that Banner knew that could live with the act. Clint explained that as Banner was growing angry, he saw something in his eyes. Something that showed him that Banner was about to turn. The judge has a difficult decision, because so far, the visions have all proven accurate. If they are accurate, then Hawkeye saved all of the superheroes and in turn saved the world. But if they're false, if there's even a hint that Hawkeye acted prematurely, he committed murder. Since the death of Bruce Banner, Carol has been using the Inhumans' visions to accurately prevent over a dozen potential incidents around the world. The judge asks Carol, have any of them been false? Well, no, not really, she explains. As Tony sits there waiting for the verdict to be handed out, he looks back at the readings from Ulysses and he realizes something is horribly wrong. Carol went to go see Jennifer Walters as she ended up pulling through and she told her what happened, that Clint Barton killed her cousin Bruce. She sits up in bed wanting to know what was the result. What did the judge deem? Carol can't even get the words out as her eyes begin to well up with tears, and anger begins to glow in Jennifer's eyes as she demands to know the answer. Barton was acquitted. Hawkeye walks. While this is going on, Carol tackles a woman as she was leaving a building, and they take her briefcase away from her by force, causing the first misinterpretation of Ulysses' visions. She saw that woman as a Hydra agent, and in that briefcase was a bomb. But, in actuality, the briefcase was completely empty. Meanwhile, Tony doesn't know what to do with his information, so he decides to call the heads of the Marvel Universe to explain. Ulysses takes everything in from the entire world, all of the energies and the thoughts. He creates a possible future from those visions. He's basically an algorithm that takes all of the data and says what could happen. But he's not seeing the future because it isn't there. He's using math and it's all guesswork. So I've decided to call all of you together. And that's when we see that he's talking to Medusa, Steve Rogers, Carol Danvers, Hank McCoy, Black Bolt, and T'Challa. And I'm going to listen to Steve Rogers, because whenever there's a major divide between us, it never ends well. Steve gets up and asks Carol, what do you think? She questions it, but Hank says, he checked all of the data, it's accurate. So Carol says, if someone were to come over to you and tell you that a man in the corner has a gun and he's going to shoot everyone, do you check it or ignore it? Tony questions that though. 80%? 60%? What? What percentage of it being true does it have to be for you to act on it? Tony, what if I told you those visions were only 10% correct? You're stating that if there's a 10% chance that Thanos is going to get his hands on a cosmic cube, would I stop him? That's more than enough. And Rhodey would agree. Well, I'd ask him, but... Captain Marvel tells Tony to back off and salutes Captain America before flying through the ceiling and into the skies. Tony stands there with everyone. I have to go public with this. Meanwhile, Carol goes to the woman that they arrested earlier and begins to grill her. Ulysses saw her working with Hydra. Carol can't have this one being the wrong one. The first one to finally prove Tony's research correct. But before she can figure the whole thing out, Nightcrawler teleports in, grabbing the woman and teleporting out. Carol takes her team as she walks out to the landing area of the helicarrier where she sees Tony standing with his side. Steve Rogers, Kate Bishop, Miss Marvel, the X-Men, Thor, Spider-Man, Doctor Strange, and Vision, just to name a few. Carol looks at him. Tony Stark, you're under arrest. And standing with her are the Inhumans, Magic, Blue Marvel, Shield, and some other X-Men to name a few. Good luck with that, Carol. When the public sees what you've been up to, you're going to have your hands full. What I've been up to, you just broke into a Shield facility. No matter, you're a bit outpowered right now, Carol. Stand down. Carol crosses her arms as the Guardians of the Galaxy jump in to join the fight. The heroes go to war with magic, plasma, blasters, and guns going off all over the place. Carol flies into the sky, blasting Tony's armor in the shoulder, but he uses his other arm to tear into her stomach, throwing her back. Meanwhile, Doctor Strange entangles Storm, wrapping her up tight, but she uses lightning to throw him back and freeze him. Blue Marvel then comes out, cracking Luke Cage across the face, only to have Nova fire into Blue Marvel's face, taking him out of the fight. Except, 
It didn't actually damage Blue Marble. So Nova launches into the atmosphere yelling, Crap, you didn't get burned! Sam Wilson and Magic prepare to fight, but she just teleports him across the United States. While Rocket is shooting at everyone, Spider-Man kicks him out of the fight, and then Venom tackles him, telling him, You are not Spider-Man! Star-Lord stands in front of Steve Rogers. Ah, crap, I get the one with the shield? I don't even know why you're here, Quill. I was wondering that myself. Star-Lord looks around. Who's that voice? It's me, Tony Stark. I hacked into your headset. I didn't even know it could be hacked into. We're here to help a friend. She said that you went off the rails and from the schoolyard ganging up crap that you just pulled? I can see that. I thought we were friends, Quill. Yeah, well, I'm better friends with her. But as they're discussing the merits of their friendship, Vision gets electrocuted and is so pissed that he blasts at the enemy, shooting through them because they can phase out, taking out the Guardian spaceship. Rocket is about to cry, but Black Panther grabs Tony Stark and holds him down while Carol soars in, grabbing him by the head and slamming him down! She then backhands him across the jaw, and everyone stops as a vision is displayed by Ulysses, one in which Miles Morales is shown over the dead body of Steve Rogers. Miles falls to his knees in shock. He lifts his mask up, allowing himself to breathe, and tears begin to run down his face. Why would he do that? What's gonna lead to him killing Steve Rogers? Why would he murder one of his idols? And Carol steps forward. Kid, I'm sorry, but you're under arrest. It all began at the night of the party where they were celebrating the destruction of the Celestial. Steve had planned to have the entire tower destroyed. He was going to kill as many heroes as he could. But his plan changed that night because he learned of the inhuman Ulysses. And he began to realize that if Ulysses can see the future, then he would be able to, in fact, foresee and stop many of Steve's plans. The doctor he was working with insisted that they kill Ulysses. And while Steve disagreed at first, he didn't see any other options. So that night, he broke into the Inhumans' base with the intention of ending Ulysses' life. Except, that was the same night that Tony Stark broke in and once again, his plans were shot. So he had another idea. He sent a letter to Bruce Banner, one that contained research on gamma radiation, the supposed cure for the Hulks. And thus, Ulysses had a vision where Banner was doing research on gamma radiation, and he was going to kill everyone, drawing all of the heroes to his home, and then Bruce Banner was killed by Clint Barton. The plan was simple, stage the visions and redirect everyone away from him. And that would decrease the possibility that Ulysses would receive a vision about him. It was working just fine until a vision of Miles Morales killing Steve Rogers was sent out to everyone. Luckily, no one knows Steve's true intentions, do they? Or do they know that he's been altering the visions and steering them away? But what's gonna happen now? We go back to the battlefield where everyone has just seen the vision and Tony looks at Carol. I told you. I told you this would happen. Did I not tell you? You're turning on children now. I'm not turning on him, Tony. Carol, this kid in the short time that he's been an adventure has done nothing but good. This isn't Banner. There is no gray area here. I'm not turning on him. I want him to come with us to ensure that this doesn't happen, Tony. The arguing continues with no one really knowing what to do, but in the end, Tony decides to let Miles decide for himself. Steve steps forward. May I? He walks over to Miles and he takes a knee in front of him. Hi. Hi. Why did you pull your mask up? I couldn't breathe. Put it back. The mask represents something. It represents who you are. You're Spider-Man and that means something to people. It means a lot. I would never do what that vision showed. I would never do that. I know, son. I don't know what to do now. What do you want to do? I want to go home. Then do that. We'll figure out the rest later. Carol yells at the captain. This isn't your call. He has a right to go home, Carol. But we can keep him safe. We can prevent this. We can make sure it doesn't happen. He didn't do anything wrong. Just like Bruce, just like Rhodey. Carol is speechless. Thor walks over, taking Miles by the arm and takes off to return him back home. Maria Hill then takes that as a chance to step forward and tell everyone that they're under arrest for the destruction that they've caused in the capital. But everyone begins to teleport out and then Medusa warps the Inhumans home, leaving Carol alone. As they soar through the skies, Miles asks Thor to leave him. He just wants to be left alone. And she leaves him on a roof, understanding. He falls to his knees and he takes his mask off. Tears begin to roll down his face as the vision is still fresh in his mind and he screams out. Things are rocky across the board. The Inhumans have left to protect Ulysses. The Guardians are bunking with Carol since their ship is gone. And Tony's team is beginning to divide with people wanting no part of this any longer. People are switching sides like Black Panther going over to Tony's side as things are heating up and the predictions are becoming less likely to become accurate. But after long debates on their next actions, Tony turns to Steve telling him, What happens next is up to you and Spider-Man. Carol, on the other hand, is sitting on a roof of one of the buildings looking over New York. How could it come to this? 
How could her plans fall apart so fast? Ulysses was supposed to be the answer to everything, but now? Now the vision shows one of her friends dead by a hero's hands. Maria Hill walks out with Peter Quill, Storm, and Jean Grey to let Carol know that they found Spider-Man. He's exactly where the vision said that he would be, on the steps in the capital, waiting. Ulysses is now standing at the edge of New Atelier, the home of the Inhumans, in a trance. No one knows what's going on, but Ulysses has actually traveled somewhere. Into the future, maybe into the past, or maybe he's in a different universe. He stumbles and he falls down a cliffside, landing in front of a big hulking green guy. And he looks at him and declares, MEAT! He raises his hands to crush Ulysses, but suddenly a man in a trench coat and hat leaps onto his back, stabbing him and tearing him in two! The man in the hat walks back to his horse, and Ulysses asks him, Are you Wolverine? Wolverine doesn't answer, so Ulysses asks him, What year is this? And Wolverine stops. Are you okay, kid? I, I don't think I'm supposed to be here. What year do you think it is, kid? I don't know. There's no way to tell. What are you? I'm an Inhuman. Guess you missed the last bus. The Inhumans left the planet back when the world still looked like the world. They did? Where are we? Looks like Jersey. What happened? Tony Stark happened. What do you mean by that? What happened here? But then Ulysses starts to fall back into his own time and place, and he yells out, Tell me what Tony Stark did! Everyone knows what he did. He pushed her too far. Who's her? Who's her? Ulysses says as he warps back to the present day. Meanwhile, word gets back to S.H.I.E.L.D. that Miles is now in the steps of the Capitol. Carol tells Maria to relay to the local PD that they need to stand down. She'll handle this one herself. As the police leave the area, Miles looks out and he sees Steve Rogers standing there. Back in New Attilian, Ulysses turns to Medusa and tells her to call Carol. They have to stop the fighting. They can do this. Back at the Capitol, Carol jumps out of the helicarrier to fly over to the Capitol, while Steve walks up to Miles. Why are you here? Same reason you're here, to prove it doesn't happen. Exactly right. Thank you for believing in me. Carol then arrives, hovering above them. What do you expect me to do when you arrived here like this? I don't know, maybe leave me alone like the cops did? The cops left because I told them to. Please tell the kid I'm not Satan, Cap. She's not Satan. Thank you. Now can you please come with me so that we can get you somewhere safe? She reaches her hand out, and a shield forms around Miles. Carol turns back, Tony Stark, be a man and face me! I wasn't hiding. I was giving you one last chance and that was it. And then out of nowhere, Tony rockets in with Hulkbuster armor. He hits the ground with everything and Carol catches the punch, throwing him back into the sky. He launches a missile at her, but she dodges while Captain America ducks behind his shield, protecting him from the explosion. The two Titans launch into the air and begin to throw everything at each other while Miles is yelling to let him out of this bubble. Back and forth they go until Carol has had enough and she uses everything to punch through Tony Stark's chest. Steve Rogers and Miles both look up at that hit and even shield is monitoring the situation. Blue Marvel tells Maria Hill that she needs to send them in. They can stop this, but she tells him Carol said she has everything under control. It needs to be one-on-one, -on -one, otherwise we'll have every superhero slugging it out on the steps of the Capitol. That's when Medusa calls her up, telling her, Carol has to stop. She has to stop now. Tony and Carol go back and forth, with Tony's armor falling apart. I told you that if you interfered again, I wouldn't be holding back. You also said that you wouldn't arrest a kid for something he didn't do. And then Tony fires a missile at Carol, which she dodges. But Steve gets hit by the full blast of them. The readings come back that Steve is alive, but he's unconscious. And Tony goes back to fighting Carol while Miles is punching the bubble, trying to get out. Meanwhile, back in New Atelier, Medusa tells the Inhumans Hill hung up on her. So the decision is made to get Ulysses himself to the capital to try and stop Carol. Back at the battlefield, Carol winds up with another super-powered punch, shattering pieces of Tony's arm off as he catches it. And that's it. Maria Hill tells all of the superheroes to get in there and put an end to this. They all land in front of Miles to see him in the bubble, and the first thing that they need to do is get him out. While this is going on, Carol and Tony continue to throw everything at each other. Slight problem, though. Tony's armor is failing, and his AI informs him of that. Everyone watches as Carol hits Tony in the head with everything, and as the suit falls to the ground, she begins to try and pry the mask off. Seeing that failing, she needs the helmet with everything, and then she lands on top of him, ready to throw a final punch, ready to end this right here. But before anyone can stop her, she hits him. She hits Tony with everything, completely shattering the suit. As he falls to the ground from the explosion, everyone sees a white light, and then Ulysses is showing everyone another vision. He's showing them all of the visions. He's showing every possible future to everyone. He shows a world where the monsters are fighting the monsters led by Karnak. One where the X-Men and the Sentinels are working together with only Nova to stop them. Another time and place where Spider-Man killed Captain America and the capital is falling. 
a future where the Inhumans are fighting for their lives against a robot invasion, and yet another one where the Sentinels have won against the X-Men. A world where only Carol lives up to stand against Ultron is shown, and finally a future where Odin's son is back as Thor and he's fighting Loki. Everyone sees all of these possibilities and potential futures, and a voice tells Ulysses, You are one of us now. Everyone looks up to see Eternity standing there in a white light, and he tells him, You have shown the Earth all that you can. You are now a part of the greater universe. There is more than just the Earth if you choose to join us. Ulysses smiles, finally knowing his true purpose and where he's supposed to be. And he vanishes, telling everyone, thank you. Everyone then appears back at the steps of the Capitol, with Miles holding someone again. But this time, he isn't holding Steve Rogers. He's holding a critically injured Tony Stark. Sometime later, Hank explained that Ulysses evolved into something beyond human. And then Carol and him look down at Tony Stark in a device that is meant to keep him alive. Hank says that he can't operate or work on Tony because he's been experimenting with his own body for years. And Hank is worried what would happen if he even took blood. While they have no way to really save him, whatever Tony did to himself is keeping him alive. And it kept Carol from becoming the woman that killed Tony Stark. Hank tells her, you know he wasn't fighting you, right? He trusted you. You popped open a dangerous door, Carol. And deep down, maybe very deep down, he knew that you could be trusted. You could have saved millions with it, but he was worried about who would come after you. He knew once you made profiling a thing, made it into the norm, how long would it take before someone else would use it for something less noble? He knew what would come next. He was a futurist to the end. And with that, they sealed Tony up in the device keeping him alive. Carol went to see the man in the White House, where she explained that the superhero community is pretty divided now. Some are overwhelmed, some are just trying to hang on. Some think that they know what to do while others are lost. Others are doubting themselves, some wounds will never heal, and some have been inspired to do something new. The man in the White House tells her, the winner gets the prize. What project of yours would you like funded? And she tells him, she has a few ideas. But we aren't done just yet. If Steve Rogers had manipulated the entire event by setting up the banner thing and helping the situation escalate, what did he think of the vision of him dying at the hands of Miles? Why would he go to the Capitol steps when Miles was there? You see, Following that, he returned to his base, where the doctor that he had been helping told him that he needed to kill that boy. Otherwise, he was going to die. Steve told him that the boy would be protected. And to top it off, he's going with Stark and everyone to the capital. The doctor was really confused. Why would you go to your own death? And Steve explained. While everyone was looking at Spider-Man holding my dead body, I did what I was trained to do. I looked at everything. And what I saw wasn't just my death, but it was my death on the day that Hydra was finally victorious. I won't die in those steps tomorrow. It will come sometime later, and when it does, it'll be worth it. And the first thing that happens is Deadpool tries to break into the prison that Hawkeye is being held in to free him. He wants to know why he did this, and he set up Clint with a new identity to allow him to walk free. Clint refuses to go though. He wants to take his chances within the court, and while he used to hate Deadpool, he understands him now. Deadpool makes the hard choices for people so that others don't have to, like Clint did with Bruce Banner. Deadpool tells him, yeah, it gets easier. It's the first kill that's the hardest, but after a while, I'm sure it'll be the next Punisher. And as Clint chuckles at that comment, Deadpool wished him luck in the courts and says that he'll see him and 25 to life. Meanwhile, Steve Rogers gets called to New Atelian because of a vision. Ulysses, the new inhuman that the entire Civil War II event is based around, warns Captain America that his team is about to make some very poor decisions, and it's not Deadpool that he has to worry about. It's Cable, and the children of the Atom are about to wage war against the Inhumans. Ulysses explains that Cable is keeping rather poor company right now, and Cap has to stop it. So he heads off to find Cable, and he finds him on a rainy night loading up a plane for a vacation. He shows up with the entire law enforcement team to talk it out with Cable, but Cable pushes him aside, telling him that it's just a vacation. And when he loads up in his plane, Steve stands there doubting him. On board, we see Rogue is ready to go, along with Sebastian Shaw and Toad, because they're going to find the cure to save mutant kind. If you haven't been following the mutant storylines, recently a cloud of Terrigen mist has been let loose upon the world. While this makes new and humans allowing them to grow the very same cloud will kill any mutant who breathes it. It's been a time of tension between the mutants and the Inhumans, but Cable and Rogue feel that they might have a cure to save everyone. Meanwhile, over in Tokyo, an evil organization known as The Hand is aware of the passing of Bruce Banner, and they feel that under some of their spells, he might come in handy. You know, if they would raise him from the dead. While this is happening, Deadpool goes to visit Quicksilver in the hospital. He's been recovering ever since Ultron broke his leg in multiple spots, and we see that he's on the phone with a friend. But it's not the friend that we're expecting, as we see on the other side, it's Red Skull using the brain 
brain of Xavier that he stole to manipulate Quicksilver. Deadpool goes with Quicksilver and Synapse to the funeral of Bruce Banner, where Steve asks him, where are the rest of the mutants? Why aren't they here, Deadpool? Deadpool tells him, I have no idea, Steve. And Steve warns him, Tony Stark is about to wage war with the Inhumans over the Ulysses thing. If the mutants are also going to start a fight on another front, there's going to be hell to pay. While this is happening, Cable, Rogue, Shaw, and Toad are attacking a military base where they are testing the Terrigen Mist to see if they can find a cure. As they run out of the base with the research, we find Deadpool standing in the plane, munching on a snack, telling them, You know, I had to lie to Steve Rogers for you. You owe me one. Except, Steve isn't dumb. As he stands there looking at the group, I warned you. We're in the middle of a war, and my own team of Avengers protecting Unity is breaking into a military base. Cable glares at him. You know what we're up against, Rogers. The team mists are killing mutants. Step aside. We're leaving with the research. And Steve throws his shield at Toad, knocking him down. Rogue tries to talk down Steve, but he's furious. Now you want to talk? The only way this ends is you all facing justice. Shaw steps forward. Captain, mutant kind does not have years that it'll take to convince the military to share this data. And Cable blasts Shaw with his gun. Let's speed this up. Now charged up, Shaw asks Captain to stand down so they don't have to fight. But Steve's not stepping aside, and the fight begins. Steve punches Shaw, and then Cable tackles him to the ground. He begins to choke him with one hand while he gets ready to hit him with the other, and Rogue knocks Cable off of him, stopping it. She holds him down, telling him, Everyone get on the plane. And Steve calls out, Do not let them get on that plane, Deadpool. Deadpool looks down at the case with the research, and he debates his actions. But in the end, while Steve is his friend, his daughter might be a mutant. He can't let Akira pass him by, and he throws it to Toad. Everyone except Steve, Rogue, and Deadpool leave the area. Deadpool tries to explain the situation with his daughter, but Steve doesn't care. You lied to me at my own friend's funeral. You're fired, Wilson. And then Rogue tries to defend Deadpool, and Steve says, The entire team is finished. There is no unity in the Unity Squad. Which may prove a problem shortly, as the hand begins to raise the corpse of Bruce Banner out of the ground. Rogue and Deadpool sit down to talk about what they're going to do now in their destroyed base of operations. It hasn't been repaired since Ultron wrecked it. That's when Voodoo warns them that they need to get the Avengers together to fight against a weapon of mass destruction, the resurrected body of Bruce Banner. The Hand is about to turn him to their side. Realizing they'll need help in this potential battle in Japan, they decide to get the rest of the Avengers that they can find. Johnny Storm, Quicksilver, Synapse, and Wasp. The team questions where Rogers and Cable are, but Rogue says that they'll explain it later and Voodoo makes a doorway to Japan. They arrive and they immediately meet up with Elektra and the Hand as the Hand launches an attack on the team. In the middle of Tokyo, an all-out battle begins with Rogue demanding to know where the body of Bruce Banner is being moved to. Once they drop them all, Voodoo reads the thoughts of one of the guys and learns of the location, once again teleporting the entire team to the Hand's hideout. They tear through the agents of the Hand trying to get to Banner's body, and they actually succeed. They get there and they stop the ritual that is going to revive him. No big evil Hulk to fight, until they discover that it was all a ploy to get them away from the real Hulk. He was resurrected hours ago, and he comes crashing through the wall. His hit knocked the entire team out of the building and into the snow, where Deadpool wakes up in a footprint of the Hulk because he got stepped on. Rogue and Human Torch rocket off to find a way to get the Hulk away from the populated areas, and Deadpool lets his brain mend. Siri, call Cable. I'm sorry, your highness. I don't understand ball table. Maybe the hand could resurrect Steve Jobs so I can kill him next time. Cable, I know you're there. Hear me. Over with Cable and their little group, they realize that the research that they retrieved is worthless and they're back to square one. And that's when Cable gets a news report about the team in a fight in Japan. He asks Shaw and Toad to join him as he teleports to Japan, and at first they agree. But when they poke their heads through the teleporter, they see everyone fighting the Hulk, and they realize that it's a rather bad idea to join Cable right now. They hit the Hulk with everything as they try to stomp him, and the Hulk charges at Cable. And he says to himself, damn it, what a stupid way to die. Until Rogue hits the Hulk with full momentum, launching him into the sky. No one dies today. He digs his hand into the ground to catch and steady himself. And then in his rampage, he grabs the giant Gundam statue and throws it into a building. The Avengers try to get the poor survivors out of the town, and Voodoo arrives, stating he can end the zombie Hulk, but he'll need ten minutes to prepare. Rogue tells him he has five, and Quicksilver carries him away to an isolated island known as Hashima Island. He asks how they're going to get the Hulk here, and Quicksilver chuckles. <laughs> I have no idea. And whoosh, he's gone. Meanwhile, Janet shrinks down and tries to talk some sense to him. Bruce, it's me, Janet. I know something terrible has happened to you. Well, Actually, a bunch of terrible things happened at once. I need you to fight this, Bruce. The Hulk is the strongest that there is, but I need you to be stronger. And the Hulk smashes his own head to get her out. Quicksilver runs by, catching her as she falls, and Rogue hits him in the jaw. But the hit just threw him in front of a nuclear power plant. Janet flies back over to tell Bruce that she won't let the Hulk win. She knows that this was Banner's worst fear, that the monster would prevail, and she won't let it. Rogue keeps hitting the Hulk around, trying to knock him senseless, until she throws him into the ocean, giving him no time to do any real damage to the nuclear 
their power plant. Except as they get closer to the edge of the area, the Terrigen mists in the area are severely hindering Rogue's powers. Deadpool tells everyone, I'm pulling her out, and he begins to shoot wildly at the Hulk. Synapse tells everyone that she's suppressing the Hulk's optic nerve, making it hard for him to see. And Electra tells her, that's not how you blind someone. So she runs in, jumping on his chest, and shoves her size into his eyes. That's how you blind someone. And Synapse tells her, well, I did it first. Torch zooms in and turns it up to full blast, using everything on the Hulk. And the only thing that he did was burn off the Hulk's clothing as he rampages back to the beach to get his revenge on Gianni. Rogue yells for Johnny to run, and Deadpool yells, Oh, fudge, he's nude! Play dead! Quicksilver quickly runs over, grabbing him, and then Voodoo reports to everyone that he's ready. So Cable body slide teleports the Hulk and everyone right to Brother Voodoo. Voodoo tells everyone to get the Hulk into the pentagram. And of course, this is the Hulk and no one can actually move him. So Synapse uses all of her abilities to block the signal from the Hulk's inner ear into his brain, throwing off his balance and knocking him to the ground. Voodoo throws up a magical bubble to hold him there, and then he walks into the mess to take this to the magical plane. He walks inside and he finds Banner deep inside, suppressed by the hand's magic, and he begins to remove the magical arrows. And the hand's spirit arrives, telling him, Stop! Voodoo tells Banner, Do not speak. Your spirit is in jeopardy. And then he turns to the hand's spirit. Release the Hulk. They warn Voodoo that if he does this, his brother's soul will belong to the hand. Do you pick a friend or a brother? Voodoo continues to remove the magical arrows, telling them, I choose my brother, Banner, the Avenger, because Daniel damned himself. The hand spirit tells him that they will share his words with their new slave. And once free, Voodoo tells Banner, You are free. Walk in the peace of the light. I'm sorry that they abused you. Tears stream down Banner's face as they step out of the magical plane together, and Voodoo holds Banner's dead body once again. Deadpool puts Banner into a body bag, which leads to everyone asking why Deadpool's carrying around a body bag. And the next question comes up. Was this the last Avengers mission? Is the group done without Captain America? Rogue tells them like hell it is, and Deadpool reminds them that they have unfinished business. The Red Skull still stole Xavier's brain from his dead corpse, and he's still using it to have access to Xavier's powers. So the group decides that they will continue on without Steve Rogers. And Johnny asks Electra if she'd like to join the Avengers. She laughs as she walks away, finding that hilarious. As everyone leaves, Rogue remembers how bad things have gotten. While she was dealing with the death and the disease that the X-Men have been coping with, she forgets the costs that the Avengers have paid. Hank Pym is worse than death, as he's now half Ultron. Odin's son is missing. Wonder Man is lost in her head somewhere. And now Tony Stark is down, and so is Banner. She can't shake the feeling that the worst is yet to come. And as she thinks about this, Quicksilver is wrestling with the Red Skull, still in his mind talking to him, telling him, Bring the Avengers to me right now. Steve was not the American hero that we all thought that he was. Instead, he was raised from a young age by Hydra. He had two agendas his entire life. Work for the US government as Captain America, but secretly work behind the scenes to propel Hydra's mission forward. Red Skull took over Hydra and began to push his vision for it forward, and Steve didn't exactly feel that Red Skull had Hydra's best interests in mind. So he decided to build something behind the scenes while keeping himself away from the Red Skull. He couldn't act directly directly against the Red Skull or even get close to him because the Red Skull had acquired Professor Xavier's telepathic abilities. So Steve recruited his old friend Baron Zemo to help him build a new Hydra, a secret army, a secret empire. He then manipulated his own Avengers team to stop the Red Skull. Deadpool and Rogue led the charge to recover Professor X's brain, and while it was a bloody mess, they succeeded. Steve then took Red Skull prisoner with the aid of S.H.I.E.L.D., and he let Red Skull escape. Sin, his daughter, brought her father into a hidden mansion where Steve was awaiting him. As the Red Skull entered into the room, Steve welcomes him. It had been quite a while since they had seen each other face to face. It's actually been since 1945 to be exact. But in the current day, the US government reports the situation. Red Skull's Hydra just conquered the nation of Sokovia, and he is now threatening nuclear actions if the international community does not recognize them as a sovereign nation and leave them be. Back in 1945, Captain America went to defeat the Red Skull that day for using the name of Hydra improperly and representing its goals incorrectly. But the Red Skull stopped him. He had Helmut Zemo in custody, and he threatened to kill Captain America's dearest friend, Baron Zemo, if he didn't comply with Red Skull's new Hydra order, kneel or his friend would die. In the current day, Steve once again kneels before Red Skull, as Red Skull demands to know how Steve could let this happen. It was his Avengers team that removed the brain from his skull. Steve stood up and he looked out the window into the night as he told the Red Skull that he tried, 
but it can be difficult because he failed because of who he is and what he believes. Yes, you serve me. No, you misunderstand. I serve Hydra. You fool! We are one of the same! I am Hydra! Are you? Or is that something you stole? The Hydra that I remember was a proud ancient order that valued strength over anything else. It demanded sacrifice. He then approached the Red Skull. What have you sacrificed? What have you done for the glory of anything but yourself? I think I've listened to your commands long enough. The Red Skull starts to see what's going on and he calls out for sin or crossbones. But Steve informs him. They aren't going to help. It's only us two now, Skull. Steve grabbed him by his coat and he threw him across the room and then he kicked and punched him into a table. Meanwhile, S.H.I.E.L.D. begins to mobilize its forces to go against Red Skull's Hydra. Except, Steve drags Red Skull to the window and throws him out, allowing him to fall to his death at the rocks below. I am loyal to nothing but the dream. And Red Skull was killed. He walked out of the room where Crossbones and Sin were kneeling before him. Hell Hydra. Crossbones brings him a point though. Red Skull's plan won't work without Xavier's brain and Steve tells him, that's right it won't, but my plan will work with a little help. And that's when Baron Zemo lands with the Hydra Carriers which are carrying all of the Hydra villains, all siding with Steve Rogers, Secret Empire. It wasn't difficult for Steve to take over the world. He is Captain America after all. These things have been in the works for some time now, backdoor deals and plans to ensure that there would be almost zero conflict when he took over. I mean, no one ever thought that he would betray them. It started with the Jatari. He sent out a call to them secretly, forcing them to attack the planet Earth. With such a large force attacking, Captain Marvel took everyone who could fight into space, and they took out the first line. They were there to defend the planet from this alien invasion. The big thing is, there's a new intergalactic shield that would surround the entire planet, one that would block all oncoming attacks. Except it's not working right now. Steve informs her that he has two of his best people working on it right now to try and get it up and running. That's when we see Riri Williams and the Tony Stark AI working on it. For those wondering, Tony Stark has been unconscious since the events of Civil War II, but he downloaded his entire memory, personality, and appearance into an AI which currently inhabits one of his Iron Man suits. Riri Williams is a young girl who was able to build an Iron Man suit and an individual that Tony was intending to mentor before Captain Marvel punched him into oblivion. Sharon Carter looks at Steve telling him about the other problem. An army of supervillains has started to attack New York and they just mobilize the response teams. On the ground, we see Luke Cage leading the defenders into battle. He shouts out the battle cry. All right, defenders, let's show these suckers what happens when you mess with our city, which they do all the time, but they should stop doing it. Sharon informs Steve that there's also a third problem. The Hydra forces have just invaded Sokovia, and the government formally surrendered, giving up the launch codes to all seven of the Soviet-era nukes that they had. Hydra is threatening to use them against the European countries if they don't get recognized as a new regime. And one of the S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarriers just fell off of the radar, and they have no idea where it's located. Steve Rogers has always been a master strategist, but freed from compassion and mercy, this was his masterpiece. The forces of Earth were divided, spread thin, they had won so many times before this that they didn't know failure. So when they did, they fell hard. And this is how he betrayed them. The heroes began to fall in their scattered battles, beginning with Quasar in space, an insanely powerful superhero losing to the Chitauri ship. When the protector of the universe fell, so did the forces in space's hope. In New York, Nitro ran forward, a villain with the power to blow himself up, and it was Jessica Jones who grabbed him and launched him into the sky. The explosion was so massive that it took out many of the buildings with it. And that's when the reports of Hydra attacking all over the US began to roll in. It happened. Steve Rogers was placed into complete control of the US government due to a state of emergency being called. S.H.I.E.L.D. now had control of the US military and law enforcement agencies, and Steve was in charge of S.H.I.E.L.D. That's when he acted. The shield around the planet turned on to protect the Earth from the Chitari attack, and the fact that it went live baffled Tony and Riri, but at least it went up. Everyone cheered, not fully grasping what just happened. While everyone cheered, the villains in New York began to teleport out of New York, fleeing as fast as they can. When the reports came in, the heroes once again celebrated. That's when the reports that they had found the helicarrier came across, but it was on full ramming speed for the one where the heads of shield were currently stationed. 
The two helicarriers slammed into each other, and Sharon heard the voice of Dr. Faustus coming over the intercom, a well-known manipulator with the power to brainwash individuals. He even brainwashed Sharon Carter to kill Steve Rogers years ago. She knows what's going on. They're brainwashing S.H.I.E.L.D. deck by deck. Hydra agents boarded the helicarrier and they moved forward, and as they entered the command center, Sharon opened fire on them, and Steve told them, Hold your fire. I am the man who runs the wheel. All of the Hydra agents lowered their weapons and they raised their fists. Hail Hydra! Sharon was in disbelief as the Hydra soldiers dragged her away, calling Steve Supreme Leader. He then took over the shield with Tony and Riri unable to open up the shield's door or anything, and he called up Captain Marvel. She called back, telling him that they have injured, they need to get to Earth, and he informed her, We won't be opening the doors to Earth. There will be another wave of Chitauri, and another. They will be constantly attacking the walls of Earth until they find their queen. Captain Marvel begins to grasp what he's saying. Oh my god, Steve, what did you do? What happened to you? I'm doing exactly what you would do. You should be proud of your work. You built a shield that will protect Earth from the greatest threats, and now that you're on the other side of it, this will be the last time that we speak. Every superhero capable of space combat and flight is now locked off-world. Tony begins to realize that something is very wrong, and he rockets with Riri to go over to New York. He realizes that whatever is about to happen is bad, and on the outskirts of New York, Baron Zemo holds up the Darkhold book, and in an instant, a spell is cast, locking New York City itself into the Dark World. Away from the real world, and now in the Dark Dimension, along with every superhero that was in that battle. And with that, Hydra moved forward, taking over Washington, D.C. Steve Rogers, Hydra Supreme Leader, just conquered the United States. Some time passed, and it was official. Hydra controlled it all, and they began to rewrite history. The victor always gets to rewrite history. Outside of a school in Greensboro, Brian McAllister and Jason McAllister sit while Jason explains his lunchbox was stolen, and Brian says that he'll see if he can get him another one. Jason walks into school, and the children begin the day with the ceremonial Hail Hydra. The teacher then began to tell them the new history of the world. Baron Von Strucker was killed for treason, and Armin Zola made the Super Soldier program and put Steve Rogers into it, seemingly to work for America, but in fact working behind the scenes as Hydra. This is known as the Great Illusion. And at the end of the war, with defeat in their hands, the Allied forces rewrote history, and it was Captain America who restored us to our Hydra roots. The children began to recite the guidelines of Hydra. Trust authority, punish weakness, report threats. And using that as a cue, one of the kids tells the teacher that Jason's older brother Brian, well, he's an inhuman, a dirty, filthy inhuman. And under the new order, all inhumans are supposed to report in and be held. Back at home, Brian arrives running and holding his stomach, and as he enters, he begins to vomit up a Captain America lunchbox. His power is to barf up anything that is needed for any situation. But before he can clean up the mess, Hydra comes knocking at the door to arrest the unauthorized inhuman. Meanwhile, in Las Vegas, a kid is running from the Hydra police as they are surprised when Amadeus show the Hulk attacks them. Bruce Banner was about to explode recently, so in order to save his life, Amadeus Cho took the power of the Hulk into himself. But unlike Banner, Cho can control his transformations, and he even retains a bit of his intelligence when hulked out. The kid then looks up at the Hulk, and that's when Spider-Man and Falcon land. This Spider-Man is Miles Morales, the Spider-Man of the Ultimate Universe, and when that universe collapsed, he was brought into the main Marvel Universe, and this Falcon is an individual who had his DNA crossed with Red Wing, Sam Wilson's Falcon. He then took the name of Falcon, becoming Sam Wilson Captain America, America's sidekick. They all land asking the kid for the information that he was delivering. You see, Hulk, Spider-Man, and Falcon are a part of the Resistance, and this kid just gave them a report that he had information that will save the entire world. After confirming that he is legit, they all climb into the Fantastic Car, flying off with the new Wasp driving it. The new Wasp is the illegitimate child of Hank Pym, and after Janet Van Dyne approved it, took the name of Wasp to honor her father, even though her father is a villain right now and merged with Ultron, but we'll get to that one later. While this is going on, a monster is attacking New York, and Steve Rogers steps forward asking the monster to politely leave, or he'll have it killed. The monster, of course, laughs, so Steve says it. Avengers, assemble! And that's when we see the forces that are working for Steve Rogers as his new Avengers. Odin's son, the former Thor, as the hammer now lies in the hands of Jane Foster Thor, a reprogrammed vision being forced to work for Steve. Doc Ock, now in a new body as the new Spider-Man since Peter Parker is in hiding. 
Eric O'Grady Ant-Man as the Black Ant and a possessed Scarlet Witch, Deadpool, and Taskmaster. Steve heads over to his council meeting where they inform him everything is going according to plan. They've altered the fluoride in the water to make the populace more docile, and they see no problems with the mutants to the northern border at the Sovereign Republic of New Tian. They then explain that they made a new facility to hold all of the Inhumans that they have captured. But there's a small problem a viral video of the Resistance in Las Vegas. The council states that there should be an example made. The Resistance flourishes in Las Vegas because the civilians believe in it and they allow for it. But Steve has reservations. He doesn't want to create a prison state. Yet the council tells him that he needs to act. They haven't even executed the prisoners on death row yet. When will Steve show his power? Show that he is not to be trifled with. Back at the Resistance headquarters, the doors open and Black Widow welcomes back the kids the champions as they go by in the superhero circle. While they assume that it's a successful mission, Hawkeye fires an arrow demanding to know what they were thinking. They were on a viral video. Hydra knows that they're out there yet again. The arguing continues as both Black Widow and Hawkeye want to know why the champions even left, and Viv, the daughter of Vision, explains that they went to rescue this boy. They met him on the internet! So both Hawkeye and Widow turn their weapons to him. SPY! But he explains that he was handed a flash drive from Rick Jones that can save everything. He has the answer to all of this. Hawkeye tells everyone to take him to the drunk. Back with Steve, he approaches Rick Jones in his cell. Rick Jones is the same kid that Bruce Banner saved all those years ago, but since that day he's been helping the superhero community and recently became an expert hacker. Steve walks in asking him why he did it. We gave you a nice apartment in protective custody and you stole one of the guards' phones and hacked it? Rick smiles. One of your guys has a hella guessable iPhone password. Right, and from there it took you three minutes to hack in and steal the most valuable files in Hydra's possession. Now you have to tell me, who did you give those to? Rick of course doesn't answer, and instead, he asks Steve, Was it weird for you when I used to dress up as Bucky? Steve rubs his forehead. I get it, you won't tell me, but I need people to think that you're sorry. I need them to know you understand what you did is wrong. Just say the words, Rick. Hail Hydra. Rick looks at the ground, and then back to Steve. And he sings instead. So Steve turns to leave. Oh, come on, Cap. Listen, buddy. Whatever they did to you, I know you're going to beat it, okay? I'm not giving up hope. You always come out on top in the end. And you know how I know that? Because you're my hero, Cap. And Steve walks down the hallway, sad about what has to happen next. Back in the Resistance headquarters, they lead the kid into Tony Stark's lab, calling him the drunk. He calls back, I heard that. Keep in mind, this is the AI Tony, so he can't exactly get drunk. But he reminds them that it's actually a code-based recalibration of his behavioral modifiers. There's no alcohol involved, and he's managing it. The kid is in shock. He's Tony Stark. And he delivers the flash drive, explaining that this is it. It's what's going to save the world. Tony looks at it and tells him that he'll get to it on Thursday. Shocked, the kid tells him that there's a chance to save the day with this. And Tony explains that there is always a chance. First, they thought Steve was a clone, or that he was mind-controlled. In both instances, they lost many of their troops. The fact is, this is Steve and he has won. The kid is in shock. You're a superhero. Look around, kid. There's no superheroes here. Just fugitives. Back at Hydra headquarters, Rick Jones is hauled off to a post where he's tied up. With a smile, he shouts, Avengers assemble! And the Hydra soldiers all shoot him. To prove you don't mess with Steve Rogers, the Dreadnoughts are then sent into Las Vegas. The heroes thought that it was already as bad as it can get. That was until Las Vegas was bombed to the point of no return, and the entire city was leveled. Once the bombs stopped falling, the Resistance rolled out to save whoever they could, but it was a massacre in the name of Hydra, in the name of Steve Rogers. What the heroes were really looking for was hope, and without hope, Black Widow knew what was needed. They had to kill Steve Rogers. She looked at everyone. We do not have time to mourn. We do not have time to be angry. We only have time to act. I'm looking for a team of volunteers for a mission that we all know we have to undertake. We're called Avengers, and these people, that city, demand vengeance. The man who killed them must answer for what he's done. No more games. This time, we don't shoot to wound. We cut the head off of this beast, and we take our chances with what grows in its place. We have no other choice. And Tony walks in. Actually, we do. He shows them the flash drive, and on it is Rick Jones. Hey, everyone. If you're watching this, then I must have been made dead, and that sucks. But here's the hope that you need. I know what happened to Captain America and how we can fix it. Rick explains the entire situation, the Cosmic Cube, how Steve was altered, how he believes his entire life was meant to be Hydra, how he killed Red Skull and how he took over Hydra. 
The entire plot of the last three years of Marvel is laid out for all of the heroes to soak in. But Steve knew that there would be a problem. He knew that Kobik had to be gone because they can't have a child running around with the powers of a god. So he had Kobik changed into a normal cosmic cube. And then he wanted to use it to alter the entire world into Hydra's image, not conquer it, completely change it. Eric Slavig, the scientist who studied Kobik, became attached to her though, and he didn't want her to die. So he broke the cosmic cube into pieces and he scattered them around the world. I've attached Slavig's journal and all of the data that Hydra has in the locations of the cube fragments. So you can find them ahead of Hydra and change Captain America back. Don't lose hope! And those are the last words he got out before his communication was cut off. Tony tells everyone that he looked over all of this. It's the real deal. This can work. Black Widow turns to him. A city was just wiped off the map, and you want to go play dress up again? Even after this? But Hawkeye steps in. You're wrong, Natasha. If our Steve was here, he'd be the first to tell you. She stops Hawkeye right there, like hell he would. If Steve were here and he saw himself like this, someone who would kill millions of people, he'd beg us to kill him. And if you don't get that, then you didn't know him at all. With that, she walks out of the room. And so our heroes were divided. Tony took a team and they decided that they would find the fragments using one of Ant-Man's contacts, a smuggler known for getting people to safe countries. Sam Wilson, former Captain America. Black Widow decided that she would take who she could and save Steve by killing him. It was the champions who decided to join her. They wanted to help her in a mission, but they didn't agree with killing Steve Rogers. They thought that there had to be another way. Black Widow insisted that there isn't and they need to accept that. Meanwhile, in another time and another place, a spot called the Vanishing Point. Hope existed. Hope was real. Like Rick Jones said, they can never take it from you. You could only lose it. Either way, hope has been gone for far too long for these heroes. A woman was fleeing from various villains in a mystical looking forest. And just as they were about to beat her into oblivion, a man stood before them. A powerful and a heroic looking man as he raised his fist to stop the enemy. It didn't take much, he knew how to fight. And then he reached out to the woman to help her to her feet, to save her. And she asked him, what do you want? And in front of her stood a man in military fatigues, blonde hair and a beard, and he informed her. My name is Steve Rogers, and I'm just trying to get home. Steve within the vanishing point helps the woman that he saved walk through the mysterious forest. When he finally sits down, it's because she's poisoned. She asks what he meant by he was trying to get home, and he explains that he has no idea where he is or what's going on. He woke up here, and he only remembers the basics, name, rank, serial number. But he has a feeling that there is somewhere that he is needed, some place that he needs to save. As she coughed up from the poison, he picked her up and he began to carry her through the forest. Meanwhile, in deep space, Peter Quill, Rocket Raccoon, and Baby Groot are standing in front of someone. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for coming. I hope you like the snacks that we put out. My name is Peter Quill, but obviously you know me as the amazing Star-Lord. And these are my associates, Rocket and I am Groot. We're coming to you today on behalf of our planet, Earth, my homeworld. I am Groot. Earth is under attack, its most powerful country taken over by this evil organization called Hydra, which turned out to be led by a guy that we all thought was a hero, Steve Rogers, Captain America. I am Groot. Now hold on. Not everybody buys it. This is the real Steve Rogers. Could be a clone, a robot, a doppelganger, who knows? Now to keep it straight, a lot of folks are going with the nickname Hydra Cap, Captain Octopus Head, and I'm partial to steve -el. But even with the interruptions from Rocket, Peter continues. Here's the big part. He built this force field around the planet, trapping everybody on the surface, and we don't have the firepower to take it down and get back to Earth. So we've come here to ask for your help. I am Groot. And then in front of Peter, we see the various races in space. Kree, Skrull, Badoon, all of them. We, of course, are very familiar with Earth. So just to be clear, every Earthling is trapped off of the planet by the shield, and the few remaining ones on the inside are facing certain death. Yeah, that's pretty much the gist of it. And with that, the councils begin to shout at Peter, shooting at him. Death to Earth! As he runs for cover, he calls up Captain Marvel to inform her that the request didn't go so well. Meanwhile, down in Newark, New Jersey, Black Widow is continuing her little journey to recruit people to help her kill Steve Rogers, and it has brought her to Maria Hill. They go back and forth about how Black Widow is turning over to Hill's way of thinking, and then she hands Black Widow the intel that she promised, Steve Rogers' social calendar. So Black Widow snaps at her. This is all you have for me? It's the best I can do. Informants are hard to come by when they know that they're going to be facing a firing squad, and most of my best people are already inside Crossbones Super Prison. 
There's some good chances here. And when you take the shot, all I ask is that you take some pictures. You're disgusting, Maria. What, he gets to kill half my friends, level a city, and I'm the bad guy for wanting his corpse as my new wallpaper? We all cope in different ways, Natasha. Besides, who are you to question me on morals? I hear you have kids working for you now. What she's referring to is the fact that the children team known as the Champions has sided with Black Widow in the superhero debate of how to handle Steve and Hydra, and she is training them to become killers even though they are still insisting that there is another way. Meanwhile, over in Montana, Sam Wilson the Smuggler, former Captain America, tries to tell Tony Stark's team that this is pointless. They can't save the world with most of the world agreeing with Hydra. It would appear for many people that Hydra suits them just fine. No one is fighting in the streets and no one is opposing him. As Sam tries to walk away though, they explain that they have an answer. They can save Steve Rogers, they just need the Cosmic Cube to reverse things back to how it's supposed to be. Meanwhile, Steve reports to his situation room to an astounding Hail Hydra. The operation, led by Baron Zemo, is underway. They're attacking Atlantis, the supposed home for one of the Cosmic Cube fragments. He leads the charge into the temple where they slaughter many of the Atlanteans and they move into the temple where Black Ant finds the supposed fragment. Doc Ock moves forward to test the validity of it, but finds that it's fake. Namor has tricked Hydra again, making multiple fakes and hiding them all over the place. In response, Baron Zemo stabs the priest in charge of the temple and ensures Steve that he will find the cube. He will search until there is nowhere for Namor to hide it, and then he blows up that portion of Atlantis. As he gets these reports, Steve also gets the report of another cube fragment. One in a very sketchy area, a very hostile area. They ask who Steve wants to send in, and he informs them that he'll handle this one all by himself. Meanwhile, Tony Stark's AI has convinced Sam Wilson to help them, and he begins to move them through the backwoods to get them to safety. His rules are simple. Everyone listens to him, and no one runs ahead. But Mockingbird notes that the device that Tony Stark has made to track the cubes doesn't actually say that this is where the cube is. So why not tell everyone where they're actually going? Tony shushes her, because if they knew where they were going, no one would go. They'd be fools not to run the other way. And in this area that everyone is heading to, sits one man. No one expected to be on Earth when the shield went up. Hank Pym, merged with Ultron. Pymtron sits in his home, informing his Jarvis to open up the front gates to everyone. Let them walk in. It'll be so nice to see the family again. Over inside the vanishing point, though, the alternate Steve Rogers lays the woman down to rest, and he continues on his journey alone, hoping for the possibility of a better tomorrow. He walks forward, snapping twigs and branches as he goes. Then various Captain America villains jump out to stop him, and two more individuals run up to save the day. Together, the three of them drop each of the enemies, and they stand triumphantly together. All three men of the same condition, though, they can't remember anything, and they agree that they could use friends, perhaps even family. So, Steve Rogers, Bucky Barnes, and Sam Wilson continue to walk through the forest of the Vanishing Point. But Black at Black Widow's team, the Red Room, she has a Hydra agent hostage. She begins to beat him relentlessly, taking a knife to his throat. His screaming attracts the kids who walk in, telling her to stop what she is doing. They insist that this is torture and she needs to end it. He obviously doesn't know anything, but she explains that he is on the cook staff in the rebuilding ceremony, and he was given a tour of the site, which means someone needs to get her duct tape and a blanket. Once again, the kids argue against torture to get the information, and Riri walks over, untying the man, who proceeds to grab the knife from his boot, leaping at her, shouting, Hail Hydra! Luckily, Black Widow shoots the man before he can get anywhere, and then tells the kids, Wonderful job! Now we have to switch motels. Meanwhile, up in the far north, in Alaska, Pimdron's territory sits Tony's team and Steve Rogers' team approaching it. Tony explains to his team where they are. The area is dubbed the Ultronic Territories, and most people don't even know that it exists. Before the planetary shield went up, Pimtron returned from the stars where he was last located after fighting against the uncanny Avengers, and we will link that story down below. Instead of trying to destroy the world or attack the Avengers, he instead built a city to the north where he builds more Ultrons. Hydra declines that it even exists, and rumor has it that Steve and Pimtron have an understanding. Scott Lang steps forward asking if this is really Ultron because it's wearing Hank Pym's face. Tony explains that it is wearing that face as a trophy. Ultron and Hank are merged, and ever since then he's been a villain trying to defeat the heroes in the name of Hank Pym. If you're curious about that story, it's called Rage of Ultron, and I'll link it down below. While they are approaching, Jarvis reports to Pimtron that they are there. I hate to see them like this, you know. We're supposed to be a team, a family. Now look at us, divided, torn apart, but all is not lost. I can fix this. I will make things right. Hank Pym is going to save the Avengers. 
At that moment, everyone runs to their objectives, and right away they cross paths with the opposing team. Ant-Man versus Black Ant, Mockingbird versus Taskmaster, and Sam Wilson versus Vision. But the most significant is Quicksilver versus Scarlet Witch, to which he's surprised that she's even around, but unaware that she's possessed. As he runs off from her attacks, Herc declares that he'll help Quicksilver, but that's when Odin's son arrives, swinging his axe at his former friend. In the middle of all of this, Steve comes face to face with Tony Stark's AI. Tony? Steve? Not gonna lie, kind of excited about kicking your butt and nobody being mad at me afterwards. You're not the only one who's been looking forward to this, Tony. Tony fires his blasts and Steve blocks them with his shield. And at that moment, Pimtron enters the scene, blasting everyone and knocking them out. No, no, no. This will not do at all. I'm sorry it had to be this way, but please know that I've missed you all so dearly. It's so good to welcome you home again. They all wake up, bound to a large dinner table. Where are we? It's Avengers Mansion, or some kind of replica of it. Seriously? What is this? And that's when they see Pimtron there with an apron that reads, Kiss the Overlord. It's really nothing. It's a little something that I whip up in the kitchen. Honestly, Jarvis did most of the work. Mockingbird says it best. This is officially the creepiest thing that I've ever been a part of. Agreed. Ultron, you will release us now. Odin son adds. And Pimtron walks over. Ultron? Thor? Don't you recognize me? Can't you see my face? I'm your old pal, Hank Pim. Though I look around the table and I don't recognize most of you nowadays either. Tony steps in. I can help with that. Steve's had his reality rewritten by the Cosmic Cube, Scarlet Witch is possessed by a demon, Vision is infected by an AI virus, and Thor just wants his hammer back. Actually, Tony, I was referring to your side of the table, or more specifically, you in fact. What happened to the charming charismatic figure that we all were in so much awe about? Who is this nervous, overreaching mess of a man in his place? I don't understand it. I know it's you in there, but what's the point of the old arc? Nostalgia? Steve helps out, though. Hardly. From what I hear, he's so drunk he can't pilot the newer models. Everyone begins to argue again, and Pamtron eventually stomps it. Enough! Listen to yourselves, bickering back and forth, always at each other's throats. It's all you ever do anymore. What's happened to you? Where did it all go so wrong? You know, this is exhausting, and in this form, I can't even be exhausted. Do you know why Ultron built this city and didn't come after you? Because you're tearing your lives apart. He didn't need to attack you. You're doing the work for him. He can just await you out. Steve takes this moment to chime in. Ultron, I agree with you, but Hydra is going to change all of that. Bring an end to all of this weakness and corruption. Oh, of course, Steve, of course. Just like Tony's grand plans with the Superhuman Registration Act made everything so much better. Or when Wanda tried to fix things, creating the House of M. Oh, but that got a bit messy, didn't it? You always have big ideas for fixing problems, but you keep making things worse. That's why I brought you here, so that we can all sit around and have a nice dinner together, break bread and laugh like the old days, reconnect with what we lost. Steve certainly tells him, I'm not interested in nostalgia. You have something that belongs to Hydra. And Mockingbird stops him. We have a slightly different idea of who that belongs to. But Tony chimes in. Do you have any idea why we stopped having these dinners? These parties out by the pool, Hank? Because of what you did to Janet. Pimtron snaps, growing in size and grabbing Tony. How dare you! I discovered Pim Particles! I took artificial intelligence to the next level! I founded the Avengers Academy! What have you done? Your arrogance started two wars, your incompetence put Norman Osborn in power, and now you lecture me! Scott Lang begins to talk down Pimtron, telling him that while Scott himself was a screw-up, he looked to Hank as a guy who didn't let screwing up hold him back, and he still sees Hank as someone who would do the right thing. So, Pimtron shrinks back down to his original purpose. He invites everyone to have dessert, except on Scott's plate is the Cosmic Cube Fragment. Everyone gets up to leave and Pimtron allows them, but before he can leave, Steve asks Pimtron. Ultron, what was the point of the whole charade back there if you were just going to hand the cube over? You keep calling me Ultra. Wait, is that why? Steve loaded up and everyone left. He went back to the Supreme Command and it is there that we see Namor waiting for him. After destroying locations at Atlantis, Namor was there to deliver the piece of the Cosmic Cube so that he could end the conflict between Hydra and Atlantis. Regardless of Tony winning against Ultron, Tony's team is still not ahead of anything as Steve just got a piece anyway. And honestly, he's not too concerned about Tony winning back there either. They have a man on the inside. Someone working for them on Tony's team. But who could that be? Over in Washington, D.C., Viper gets a report that the Hydra agents have just captured Black Widow. She walks in to see Black Widow in chains, and so they begin to question her as to what she was planning. 
Meanwhile, outside, the champions are looking at the facility and they decide that it's time for a rescue mission. Black Widow proceeds to give up all of the information on her plan. Steal a Hydra transport ship and kill Captain America. Viper is shocked. Why is she giving her all of this information? And Black Widow looks her dead in the eyes. Because, Viper, you shouldn't be concerned about me. You should be concerned about Supreme Leader finding out about your little illegal operation here. Or you could help us out, and not only would you be spared of Steve's wrath, but you could lead Hydra when we take him down. Viper pulls out two guns shooting the guards next to her, telling Black Widow, Ah, uh, just a moment. The champions actually were breaking into another facility to rescue a shriveled old man. Meanwhile, Tony continues his journey and they arrive in Wakanda for the fragment that T'Challa has, but he refuses to give it up. Instead, he offers Tony's team the option to bring him the fragments and he will use them to complete their cause and do exactly what they want. But he doesn't trust them to have it. So they go to their next location, Madripoor, where they rescue Shang Tsi, who supposedly has another fragment, and as they find out, he lost his when Hydra beat him, and it looks like it was the X-Men that took it. The fact that they aren't collecting any more pieces brings Sam to question Tony's device, the one that's supposedly tracking where these shards are, and it's obviously not working. And Tony tells him that there must be some residue of the fragments that are triggering it. It does work. Trust him. Everyone begins to disagree that this is becoming a problem. They haven't won anything and they keep losing the fragments. What's next? Over in Washington, the Hammer of Mjolnir sits in a field. And Ambassador McCoy of the Mutants in the North questions why Steve just left it sitting there. Steve welcomes him, asking him how things are in New Tian. And McCoy explains that there are problems, but the mutants have their own nation run by them now. It's a day that he never thought that he'd get to see. So Steve asks him, Well then, can you explain to me why Kraken has told me that you have something that belongs to me? McCoy tells him, I have no idea what you're talking about. And Steve tells him, There's a reason that I left this hammer in the field. To remind all of those around me of its power. That at any time, I can lift it again. The hammer views me as worthy, so it is by my compassion that I do not use it. McCoy asks him, Are you threatening me? No, I'm reminding you. I assume I'll be hearing from your office soon. Steve leaves McCoy there to think on that for a moment, and as he boards his helicopter, he questions how his Avengers are doing. They explain that Vision is fine under the control of the AI virus, though there is a hiccup once in a while. But Odinson? He's a bigger problem. You may have been wondering why Odinson teamed up with Steve at all. Well, he questions if what he is doing is the right thing. Hydra tells him that they can save Jane Foster from Purgatory, the one that she now resides in, and that they can restore the bridge to Asgard, but he senses that all of this is a lie. The things that he has seen, the innocents being persecuted, the evil gaining control, fear taking hold. But he questions all of it, because Steve Rogers is worthy, and if he is capable of lifting the hammer when Odinson is not, then shouldn't Odinson just follow him? Steve informs Hydra that Odinson listens to him, and he'll talk to him. So with everything still moving forward, Tony's team returns to base, to home. They say hello to everyone, and Tony goes into his lab, where he meets up with a few of the others, and they ask how things went. Raj asks the big question, did you tell them the truth? The kid from before asks what truth, and Tony explains it to him. It didn't go well. Tony, in fact, has never had a way to track the cube fragments. They're working entirely off of Rick Jones' data. Tony just built them hope, a pretend machine that made them think that they had a chance. But elsewhere, Mockingbird makes a call. This is Mockingbird, and we have returned to the base, and we only have two fragments. Up above, Hydra's dreadnoughts move in, and Tony feels them approaching, shouting, TURN ON THE SHIELDS! They open fire on the mountain base with the resistance, and Steve gets a report that they won't be able to break down the defenses. So Steve tells them, Do not worry. I have a secret weapon. Meanwhile, in the vanishing point, Steve, Bucky, and Sam walk forward until they trigger a trap. Sam is captured, Bucky is knocked out, and Steve is hit in the back of the head. And that's when they meet their assailant, Red Skull. Back in the regular universe, Steve walks into a room where he sees Bruce Banner, a very much alive Bruce Banner. The Hydra agent explains that the spell that they use to revive him is only temporary. He has very little time, and Steve might want to make this happen fast. Odinson then leaps from the battle carrier into battle, shouting, FORGIVE ME! And he slams into the side of the resistance base, taking out portions of the mountain with him and barreling into the headquarters. Yet all he can do is dent the wall as the shields are holding up. The team asks Tony if Odinson is strong enough to break through, and he tells them that he isn't, and then he turns back to the group. Our problem outside is being handled, but inside we have a larger problem. Someone in this room is Hydra. Everyone begins to turn on each other, such as accusing Quicksilver of running off and helping Hydra. But he defends that those times he ran off, explaining that he was looking for his sister. Meanwhile, with Steve, he stands before Bruce. Steve, can uh, you explain something to me? You're Hydra now? How long have I been dead? Steve tells him, 
I understand that this must be disorienting for you, and I wish that I could explain everything, but unfortunately you won't be around that long, Bruce. Back with Tony's team, Quicksilver asks Mockingbird why is she sneaking off making secret calls, and she outright tells them she's actually been reporting everything to Maria Hill. Using this as a moment of truth, Roz steps forward explaining Tony's device never even worked. Everyone begins to reveal secrets and argue, and that's when Scott Lang steps up. Everyone, stop, all right? It was me, I'm the traitor, I called Hydra. Back with Steve, he tries to explain everything that he can. What happened to Banner? Why Hydra is good? And why he should be helping them? And Banner tells him, no, just put me back in my box. Steve looks at him. I wasn't talking to you, Bruce. The eyes of Bruce Banner begin to glow green. Quicksilver turns on Scott, slamming him into the wall, demanding to know why. And Scott tells them that they got Cassie, they found his daughter, and they're using her as a hostage. And that's when Tony sees it on the screen, the one thing that can break through the wall, and the Hulk smashes through it. Steve jumps down to walk in after him, and the Hulk begins slamming everyone around while they try to fight against him, all except for Hawkeye. He takes a knee, ready to face his judgment for killing Bruce all those months ago. The thing runs in shouting, it's clobbering time! And he throws the Hulk into a wall, so the Hulk counters with a punch so hard that it breaks off pieces of the thing. Raj steps back up with the ultimate distraction for the Hulk, androids of the original Avengers team, and he sends them off to distract him. The Resistance uses that chance to flee. They try to get out of there, but there are hundreds of Hydra soldiers opening fire on them. When they get to their ship, their only escape, there stands Odin's son ready to stop them all. Until he tells them to go. Get out of here. They load up into the ship and they blast off to escape, all except for Tony, who decided to go back to his lab where Steve was waiting for him. They begin to punch it out as the Hulk begins to degenerate and fall apart, turning dead again. Steve stands over Tony. Zola explained it to me. You downloaded your actual consciousness into this AI. So for all intents and purposes, it's actually you, which is good because I would hate to think I'm going to kill a machine. He raises his shield to finish off Tony and Tony shouts, wait, I'm sorry. While he says that, though, Hydro Command picks up a weird energy signature from the mountain. Tony goes on. I know it's not really you in there, but I still want to say it. When we went to war and I stood over your body, I knew I hadn't won anything. All I'd done was fail you. I said then that it wasn't worth it, and when you came back, I told myself that I wouldn't make that mistake again. But I did, over and over. And I thought that this time it was going to be different, right? This was my chance. I could be you this time. Give them all hope to make them believe in something, and I screwed it up didn't I? Because I can build the most amazing things, but I can't make myself what you are. All I can do is fake it, Steve. So please know, I wanted to save you so badly because I wanted to be for you what you always were for me. My hero, I'm sorry that I let you down, Cap. And Madame Hydra runs in shouting, Steven, goodbye, son. And as the building explodes in a massive explosion that Tony set off, Steve is teleported away, saving him from that death. Meanwhile, in the Red Room's base, Black Widow's team. She walks over, waking up the champions, pouring a drink for herself. Hydra has won. Your friends are all dead. Tomorrow, we kill Captain America. But before we can continue that story, there's the vanishing point, where it would seem the classic Steve Rogers still exists, and the original Red Skull. In this world, the Red Skull is beating into Steve, telling him, This is my gift to you, Hal Rogers. You will escape this place, and at least you will know peace. But back in reality, Steve is standing in his command center, thinking of the death of Madame Hydra, the one who saved him. She was basically his mother within Hydra, treating him like her own son, and now, he lost her. He turned back to his troops, and he told them, This one is for you, Alyssa. He stepped out onto the steps of the Capitol building to give a speech, a vision for this new Hydra-run government. But nearby stood Black Widow, calling out to the Red Room team, which is the champions, to inform them that it is time to get into position. Earlier, she had debated with Spider-Man Miles Morales, as he felt that he was the one who was going to make the kill to murder Steve Rogers. As he told her, during the last Civil War, the Inhuman who could see the future said that Miles would kill Steve. But Black Widow tells him that she can't allow that. She won't let him cross that line, she'll do it. To ensure that he won't interrupt her, she locks him in a vehicle, and that's the last that she saw him. The whole operation was then placed into motion and staged by Black Widow. The kids were in place as a distraction, and the old man that they rescued from prison was Mosaic, an inhuman with the power to possess people. Black Widow sent Mosaic out to take over the Hydra guards and start a commotion, and the kids are about to start the distraction while she positioned for her shot. That's when she found herself under attack. 
Frank Castle, the Punisher, opened fire on her, sent by Hydra to remove the threat known as Black Widow. As she kicked the Punisher in the face, she asked him, what did Steve promise you to get you onto Hydra's side? And Frank told her, a safer world. Meanwhile, Spider-Man breaks out of the vehicle and begins to swing towards the Capitol building. Black Widow and Punisher go back and forth, both highly trained and capable of delivering damaging blows. But in the end, Black Widow is just trained more and she got two knives into Frank's legs. Black Widow looked at Frank as he told her, Steve said he would bring back everyone that we had lost with the Cosmic Cube. My family, Natasha. She got back into position to open fire with the rifle and that's when she saw through the scope that Spider-Man had gotten up. He had walked up to Steve and she knew that this was bad as she leaped out of the window. Both Steve and Miles saw the vision. They knew what was about to happen. Miles was supposed to kill Steve. And as Steve tells Miles, we both know how this ends. So let's see what you're made of. Natasha is pushing her way through the crowd, getting closer and closer. Steve raises his shield, and as he goes in, Natasha jumps in the way, pushing him. But that shield, it still came down. It still did its damage, and it broke Black Widow's neck. Her eyes went lifeless and cold, and she hit the ground, killed by Steve Rogers. Miles saw it and he shouted, No! as he charged at Steve. In a single punch, Miles broke the shield that Steve had been using as a replacement for his original, and then he knocked Steve to the ground with a second punch. He walked over, grabbing Steve's body and raising him up, prepared to do what he was destined to do, to end this in murder. And the wasp floats over, telling him, Don't do it. Don't murder him. And don't do it for yourself. Do it for her, for Natasha. She didn't want you to become a killer. She would want you to be Spider-Man. So he throws Steve's body down, leaving him injured, and the Hydra guards run up, grabbing their supreme leader, while the champions are all arrested. As Steve is brought out of sight, he is brought over to Sharon Carter, the woman who stood by his side all of these years, and now that he's a Hydra agent, doesn't want anything to do with him. She also tries to murder him, and he pushes her aside, calling for the guards to take her away, bring her to brainwashing. Meanwhile, in the vanishing point, the other Steve is about to be murdered by the Red Skull when he sees a woman, and he sees her as hope. Hope that he can get through this. So he dodged the club, kicked the Red Skull before running him towards the cliffside. They both plummeted over it and into the water down below as he thought to himself. It's that glimmer of hope that keeps us alive. In the real world, the news of Black Widow's death reached the remaining members of the Resistance, and everyone thought it was all lost. The fight was over. But it wasn't, was it? We just needed a glimmer of hope. And it was Sam Wilson who put back on his Captain America uniform and told them, we aren't done yet, guys. Now I'm going to break the immersion for one second to explain something. I'm going to be covering what happened within issue 8 and 9. Everything that is about to happen is going to be going very fast. But every one of these is a plot point that is actually explained in length in tie-ins. Some of them we're going to be covering, like Deadpool, The Dark Hold, and Spider-Man. But some of them we won't be covering, like the Inhuman Liberation and the Survival Beyond the Shield. Some of these you'll just have to read yourself, but we will get to them in additional videos. Now, let's go to the story. Raj gets a machine working that projects a message within the Darkhold and beyond the shield into space to the teams of superheroes scattered about. Attention, attention to everyone. This is Captain America and I have an urgent message for you. I know this is going to be hard, but I'm going to need your help more than ever now. Here in the Hydra-controlled United States, there is still an underground movement that is fighting back. Our battle has brought us to finding the Cosmic Cube. The same cube that turned Steve Rogers into Hydra Supreme got broken up and was scattered around the world. We have acquired most of the pieces except for the final one, and they are declaring war on anyone who holds it. But there is still hope. We liberated an Inhumans concentration camp and we met a new Inhuman. His name is Brian, but Tony calls him Barf. His power is to create whatever is needed at the exact moment that we need it by throwing it up. And he barfed up the last Cosmic Cube fragment. That's where all of you come in. Each individual charge of the Cosmic Cube has enough power for one wish. And I'm going to be using that wish to free you from the Dark Hold over in New York and bring down the shield over Earth. I know that some of you want to give up hope. But this is our moment, our chance to turn things around, and I know that we've been divided, torn apart, and broken for so damn long, but now it's time to assemble! Tony Stark looks at Sam Wilson. He survived the explosion he set for Steve because he still isn't the real Tony Stark, he's an AI construct. He looks at Sam, like I told you Sam, I used it to wish myself a birthday cake and then I tried to wish myself into being a real boy, but it didn't work. So you need to get up there and wish for nothing until you are high enough to affect everything. Then try and will it into existence like super hard. Good luck, Cap. And Sam, when you're up there, whatever you do, don't think of the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man 
As Sam launches himself into the sky, everyone in the dark hold and outside of the shield is getting ready. They need to be prepared to charge in. Sam soars through the air, but of course, this sets off the Hydra defense alerts and the jets are scrambled. Sam knew that this was it, the last hope, the last shot, and the jets opened fire on him. So, if this was the last hope, imagine how it felt to see it crushed so quickly. That's when Sam was shot and he began to fall out of the sky, plunging into the ocean below. That was it. The heroes had lost. The heroes in the Darkhold were forever lost to the darkness and the shield would never fall, or would it? You see, at the start of all of this, Quasar was rendered unconscious, but she had now finally awoken. She'd like to try cracking that shield, because while the heroes fell again, it was time to get back up and fight again. Sam lifted himself up out of the water, bleeding and injured, and Quasar hovered over the shield, bombarding it with everything. She used the power of the Protector of the Universe to shatter it into bits! While the heroes in space began to move on the Chitauri Queen that Steve had kidnapped, something else was going on. Yes, the heroes in the Darkhold couldn't get out, but as it turns out, there was one man who was maintaining that spell, and one woman who had the knowledge of this. She got this knowledge from Deadpool, who had secretly been working as a double agent, pretending to help Steve, but actually finding out the info. While while Deadpool himself had been left to die, Maria took the information and shot Black out in the head. Captain Marvel during this swooped into a random house, destroying it in a single blast as she prepares for the fight with her ex-hero. And as she does that, the dark cold bubble around New York falls and the heroes realize that they have won. There is hope! Hope lives on, and they can still prevail in this battle. And so, they were ready to end this tale. But inside of the vanishing point, the other Steve was still pushing through the forest. The woman who gave him hope wasn't real, and she began to fade from existence. And as he realized that it was Sharon Carter, the love of his life, and his only reason to exist, he began to scream out in frustration. That's when he heard a child's voice, the voice of Kopik, the little girl in the Cosmic Cube. They're all gone, and we're alone now. She apologized to him with tears rolling down her face as she tells him that she wanted everyone to be happy, but she messed it all up. They wanted me to make everything better, but I made it worse. Remember. Meanwhile, at the Hydra Supreme Command base, the removed King of Wakanda, T'Challa, stands before Steve and then the X-Men arrive to discuss the matters at hand. But everything is slowed down by the battle, the battle from the heroes that are pushing forward. Steve just says, I have them right where I want them. All the heroes begin to get closer to the capital, and even Peter Parker finally leaps in asking, Hey guys, what did I miss? Besides the fascist takeover of the United States, lots of death and destruction, general chaos, kind of an insensitive question now that I think about it. From across the globe, the heroes have all returned. They have all been given hope that they can finally end this and take back what Hydra has taken from them. Meanwhile, Emma Frost and Steve begin their talks on the mutant surrender and how Hydra is going to be taking over New Tien. But Emma informs him, no mutant will ever kneel to you. And luckily, Magneto agrees with me. Magneto then begins to pull out the Hydra Dreadnoughts from the sky, pulling them to the ground, crushing the metal that they are made of as he is the master of metal. And even with all of that, the heroes didn't have enough to win. They were beginning to lose until one individual had seen enough. Odin's son called out, no more. During this, the champions got free from their prison and they joined the fight, and while the heroes fought for the future, the future fought for them. Viv went to her father, clearing him of the virus. Doctor Strange exercised the demon out of Scarlet Witch, and with a little help from Thor, as he summoned her back from the plane of existence that she had been banished to. Bucky frees T'Challa, bringing the Black Panther into the fight, and even Sharon Carter, who was faking her brainwashing, sees the heroes finally prevailing, sees the hope of victory, and she begins to program the shield helicarriers that Steve stole, causing them to fall out of the sky through all of it! Steve still had a plan, and that was to have the cosmic cube that he had collected placed into his armor, into his chest, making him a god. Can the heroes win against a god? But back in the vanishing point, Kobik hits Steve with his memories and he begins to remember. He was a soldier, fighting for a cause that he believed in, and there was a battle where he was about to die when he woke up. Here, in this place. I don't understand. Am I dead? Am I dreaming? Can I go home? Who am I? And Kobik showed him a pool. And in that pool was what had happened while he was gone. He conquered the U.S., taking forth the Hammer of Thor, and he killed the Red Skull. He realized what he was and what was happening. He wasn't in his mind. He wasn't dead. This wasn't the afterlife or some other dimension. This is Kobik's memory of the people that she changed. And that is all that he is. A memory of how Steve needs to be. So he asked her to bring him back, put him back into reality. The world shook. 
something was coming, so Kovic ran. Because in the real world, while the heroes had defeated the armies, the ships, the vehicles, they hadn't defeated Steve. Now, Hydra Steve stood before them in battle armor with a cosmic cube in his chest. And he looked down on the heroes. Stand down. Look, we're finally here. But you're too late. The time for fighting is over. It's time to rebuild. Hydra is going to use the Cosmic Cube to restore the old world. Forge it into something better. Stronger. And Logan stops him. I don't think you got any takers in the crowd, bub. So Hawkeye is the one who calls it. For Nat. Avengers, assemble! And as the heroes charged against him, they didn't stand a chance. With a single punch, he leveled them all. He erased all of the Marvel heroes from existence, bringing the entire universe into the vision that he foresaw. The entire world was altered, rewritten in Hydra's vision. Steve had won. This was the end of our story. He gazed out and he was pleased. He saw a vision close to perfection. But something was missing. Hope still survived. That's when we hear a voice. You know, a wise man once said, it's not over until the fat lady sings. And that's when behind Steve, we see Sam, Scott, and Bucky. Sam steps forward, kneeling before Steve, saying the words, Hail Hydra. And he presents the last piece of the cosmic cube to Steve. That was it. Steve had become omnipotent. And then, it was gone. You see, Ant-Man and Bucky were shrunken down and in the cube, so when it merged together, Bucky went into it to get one thing. Inside of the vanishing point, the alternate Steve was looking around for Kovic, and when he found her screaming and crying out, he told her, let me help you. Above them, a door had opened, and together, Steve and Kovic were pulled out of the cosmic cube and into reality. Behind Steve stepped out Kovic, who reverted the world to the way it was supposed to be, and that's when, in front of Steve, he was faced with his nightmare. The true hope of the Marvel Universe, Captain America, stood before him, and the red, white, and blue with a rather angry look upon his face. This imposter, this fraud, looked upon the real Captain America. You're not real. And Cap looked back at him. Best as I understand it, that's up for grabs at the moment. It's time people saw the truth. As the two individuals began to battle it out, they were matched far too evenly, and with each punch thrown, there was another just as strong to follow it up. Both men saw Thor's hammer out of the way, in the middle of the field, and both men dove for it. Steve grabbed the hammer first, but this was the moment that he had dreaded, the reason he had never wielded the hammer, because his rise to power was on the back of a lie. He was never worthy. So, Captain America walked over. Here, let me try. And Captain America picked up the hammer and swung it hard. The blow was so hard that it shattered Steve's armor and threw him to the ground. Because only the true Captain America is worthy. And it was at this moment that Steve, no, steve was defeated. And Captain America stood over him. That was it. It was over. The Secret Empire had been defeated. Captain America returned the hammer to Thor. And Kobik looked at everyone. I'm sorry I got it wrong, but I know what to do now, and I'll fix everything. So she restored the proper timeline and removed the threat of Hydra once again. She then gave a gift to all of the heroes, something to remember the hope that they needed, to discover who they really were. This is the Generations tie-in, and I'll be covering those in a bit. But once they all came back from their little excursion into the entire universe, they had a newfound purpose, one that told them why they're heroes. Why they are the Earth's mightiest heroes. There you have it, our Secret Empire, telling you exactly how we got to where we are in Secret Empire. Now let me know in the comments down below, how do we do? Do you feel that all of these pertain to the actual storyline, that they are important? And also, if you want to support us and join the Comic Story and Premium membership, please consider going over to our Patreon, where we release a lot of our videos early access there, days before they get put up into the actual YouTube. Either way, guys, just watching this is a huge support to us, and I really do appreciate it. And uh, overall, I'll see you next time right here at the Comic Story and Channel.